Welcome into the best in true crime podcasting. This is True Crime Tuesday. I'm your host, Tim Dennis. You know, there is a war on drugs. There has been a war on drugs ever since the 80s. It was Ronald Reagan who started the war on drugs. Lately, the drug that is the scourge of America is fentanyl. It seems like this has popped up out of nowhere. In fact, if you believe any administration in the last 8 to 12 years, you'll believe that it's come from Mexico and that it's come over that southern border and that that is where it's come from and that that is where it's being pushed from and that this is a relatively new problem. It isn't. As a matter of fact, it first hit the streets 1991. Or 1990. We'll have to ask our guest, John Mattinger. I'm trying to remember off the top of my head. Um, it's an old problem. It's fact, it's a it's a medical situation that had uh, a bit of a like most illegal drug issues, um a medical solution that gets turned into something evil. It gets broke bad, so to speak. Um, a lot of times you get a chemist who's curious and decides, you know what, I can find a good or a bad solution from it. Chemists don't know good or bad. They just know, right? They find a chemical solution. They play with chemicals and there is no good or bad when it comes to playing with chemicals. And what's interesting about this book that we're going to talk about today, Lethal Doses, the story behind the Godfather of Fentanyl, a wonderful book that our guest John Mattinger has has wrote, and I highly recommend you read this book. It's fascinating. Is when it comes to science, there's no good or evil. There just is. And the subject of our book, George Eric Marquardt, the man who figured out how to bring fentanyl to the streets. He didn't do it because it was good or evil, but he realized that if they took fentanyl out of the surgical arena and put it on the streets, it was going to kill people. And there were implications, but it wasn't his implication. And that was a huge moral weight. We're going to talk about it with our guest today, John Mattinger. Let me tell you a little bit about it before, or about him before we bring him in. John joined the drug war in 1974 as a sheriff's deputy. He then served as a narcotics agent, supervisor, and administrator, and a special agent criminal investigator with the U.S. Department of the Treasury for hitting mandatory retirement age in 2010. He spent 15 years of that time in undercover assignments from Florida to Honolulu and worked major fraud and money laundering cases, becoming one of the country's leading authorities in money laundering and the author of a textbook, Money Laundering, A Guide for Criminal Investigators, which is used by universities uh, by the Departments of Justice, Justice and Treasury and foreign governments around the world. Uh, John holds a bachelor's degree in criminal justice from Indiana University and a master's degree in history from the University of Hawaii and graduated from the Oklahoma State Police Academy, the Drug, Enforcement's Administ or Drug Enforcement Administration's National Academy, and was the honor graduate in the Treasury Criminal Investigation Training Program. He's received numerous awards and citations from the Internal Revenue Service, the Drug Enforcement Administration, and the Organized Crime Drug Enforcement Task Force Program, and was certified to testify in federal court as an expert witness on money laundering. As part of his job, he developed and taught classes on money laundering and financial crime in the United States, Asia, Europe, Africa, and the Caribbean, working overseas in over 20 countries. Now, on the literary front, he wrote another textbook called Confidential Informant, Law Enforcement's Most Valuable Tool, and a history of the opium trade, Opium Kings of Old Hawaii, as well as two novels, Death on Diamond Head and Pipe Dreams, and a memoir, Going Under, Kidnapping, Murder, and a Life Undercover for Wild Blue Press, a finalist for Killer Nashville's Silver Falcon Award. He's also received awards for fiction, nonfiction, short stories, academic writing, and even poetry. Let's welcome into. True Crime Tuesday, John Mattinger. Hi, John. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me on this morning. Well, thank you uh, for coming in and, and being on the program. John, this book is so fascinating. I mean, this this book, I get chills just thinking about, uh, you know, the, the, the trip that you bring us on in this book, because you talk about a scourge that, that 
you described or you quoted somebody in this book, and I don't remember who it was you quoted that said this, that it, I believe it was a law enforcement official that said, this is Pandora's box. Once the lid comes off of fentanyl, it, there were, what was it? 1400 different chemical combinations for fentanyl that could be exposed to the, uh, the drug taking public. Is that what it was? Well, that's if they've discovered 1400 different, um, analogs or chemical cousins of fentanyl comp compositions uh, that could poten potentially produce some kind of uh, pharmaceutical output, pain killing or, you know, getting high or whatever, so have some pharmaceutical effect. Um, yeah, but actually, the, I had a conversation with a, a chemist about this and Based on the four different methods that are used to prepare fentanyl these days, one of which was developed by our character in this book, um, there, there potentially are, are 3.7 billion possible combinations. So it's almost infinite. And one one chemist that I talked to said, I asked, how many variations do you think there could be? And, and he said, it's infinite. So it's a, it's a fascinating drug and that's one of the reasons why uh marquardt george eric marquardt squeak the character in in the book that's one of the things that attracted him to it was the fact that it was uh that there were he was able to develop compounds that nobody had ever had ever seen before and had ever developed before and that was one of the things that he, he liked about this was that he was had such variety and he could be the first to conquer that that mountain, that Everest. And, and that was one of the things that appealed to him. Now, John, when you think about it, and, and of those 3.7 billion, there's none of them that's non-lethal. I mean, they all will kill you. And, the, and it's just it just takes a small amount to kill you. Yeah, it's well, that's, that's technically that's probably true there there are a couple of variations that that have no effect um that have no um uh, pharmacological value or whatever but most of them do and that's one of the things that uh, he was kind of looking for was that he was working with two different uh, i don't know if you want to get into this now before we introduce him but he was working with two different um substances that his customers wanted one was fentanyl and the other was a analog compound called 3-methylfentanyl. 3-methylfentanyl is 6,600 times more powerful than morphine. And it's like incredibly potent. And he was looking for the, he called it the Goldilocks solution, where you didn't have a, you had a substance that was about the same potency and an effect as heroin, but it didn't have the lethality that some of these other ones did. It would be easier to handle and cutting it and, and getting it out on the street and distributing it because he knew, he knew he was well aware that this was going to kill people. And he was concerned that that was going to bring a lot of heat to their, to their operation. And which of course it did. And um, he didn't want he wanted to avoid that if at all possible. We'll, we'll leave that and let that lie just so people can get an idea of where we're going here uh, today on, on the show. But I, I just want to set that up for people that that fentanyl, and, and it's still a problem today. Keep in mind that they thought that they can control this monster. I mean, and, this, and that's what fentanyl is. It's a monster. A, a monster that's gotten away. And, and I don't think there's an end in sight to this problem. Do you? No, I don't. I, I... I, I don't think there's a law enforcement solution. And I was in law enforcement for 35 years. Um, I don't I don't believe there's a law enforcement solution. I, I think you look at this situation where in 1991, 92, 93, he had the only fentanyl lab in America. He was the source for, for street fentanyl in the country. And when they when DEA busted him in 93, it ended, the fentanyl problem ended in the United States completely. Uh, overdose deaths went back to zero or, or near zero. And and there was no there, no seizures of uh, fentanyl hydrochloride, the street fentanyl uh, out there. So, you know, that, that was the situation in 91 when there was one lab in the United States. Now there's untold number of labs 
in Mexico, mostly uh, in China, uh, in India, and uh, you know any other place in the world where you can make it. And he, the process for making it when he started out was pretty difficult, and expensive, and required some talent and some ability to, to pull off. Nowadays, thanks to his development of an alternative formula, which is was commonly used until recently, uh, in, in most of these clandestine settings, um, it's a lot easier to do. It's a lot easier to pull off. And I just don't see, I don't see a solution for, for it, a law enforcement solution for it at all. I no way to keep it out uh, of the country, I don't think. Question we'll answer later on in the program as we talk a little bit about George Eric Marcourt squeak. Uh, is why on earth someone would want to make a drug this powerful that kills people, that makes them OD so so quickly and and kill them. And and we'll we'll talk about that as well as we get a little bit later into the program. Um because the answer is astounding. We'll talk about that later. Let's get into uh George Eric Marcourt, Squeak, and let's talk about his early beginnings here, John. Um tell us a little bit about his early beginnings and his early upbringing because it's it's a little fascinating as to who this man is and and how talented he is yet how seemingly traumatic his his upbringing was right very very interesting character which you know most good books you want to see an interesting character and you couldn't ask for one more fascinating to me than this guy uh he was born in waukesha wisconsin in January 1946, so at the very, very beginning of the baby boom, uh, he was raised in a traditional family in small town America. Um, in the 19, growing up in the 1950s, he was. They, they knew from the very beginning that he was a very intelligent child. He was uh, reading early and talking early, and uh, obviously had a. Um, a lot of intelligence. His family recognized that he was um, he was his his mother in particular encouraged him to read, and he was reading far above his his level, his age level, very early. Fascinated by science, mostly by electricity, uh, he got very interested in in physics and X rays and and that type of thing. And he was um, he he was in, using science and developing his abilities in that area very early. Um, and by the time he was uh, 12 years old, he was, he was already working with uh, chemistry. He had chemicals, chemi the chemistry sets that you got for when you were a kid in those days. And he had more and more of that stuff down in the basement where his parents sort of let him have free run of the place. And, um, and that's when he broke bad. He broke bad at 12. He was age 12. He started manufacturing uh, bootleg alcohol down in the basement and uh, selling it uh, in, in in Waukesha, where I guess there's a lot of demand for, for booze, probably especially in the wintertime. Um, and it, it's cold was, up here, John. It really yeah, is. <laughs> yeah. He, he, was, uh, he, was, he was selling it to making money from his chemistry very early on uh, by the time he was 14 he that he had talents were sort of on display and he was contacted by his family doctor who uh, wanted to know if he could make heroin from uh well well from anything and and the, the doctors he said yeah he could but you need you need opium to make uh to make heroin and that gets back to your question that you were just asking a minute ago, uh, why you would want to make something like fentanyl, because you're replacing something like heroin, which requires a long chain of, of uh, growers to sellers to people that refine it and people that manufacture it. And, um, and so he, that's that's one of the reasons why fentanyl is, t is taken over is because it replaces this whole, I don't need opium anymore to to manufacture it. 
they found the opium in the basement of a Waukesha drugstore where it was a it was a expired some expired cough preparation. But and, this doctor wanted this heroin because he was addicted, right? Yeah, yeah, he was addicted, and and the and that wasn't an uncommon thing back then in in those days. Uh, very very much higher uh, level of addiction in the medical profession because they have they had access more access than the average citizen did right to to narcotics they could get uh, pharmaceutical narcotics like morphine or methadone or demerol or whatever and and they there was a much higher addiction it was estimated I think it was like 17 or 20 times higher than the average population in the medical profession and so uh, he had an addiction problem and uh, he wanted to know if squeak could make him some heroin and squeak said yeah if you give me some opium i can and they got some opium and he made three ounces of pure heroin and gave it to the doctor which you know i i point out in the in the book that yeah three ounces of heroin pure heroin will go a long way but it's not gonna last forever so when the doctor needed more heroin he came back to him and said you know can you make some more and he he they looked for more opium but they couldn't find any so he said well but i can make it out of I can make it out of codeine. I can make it out of Tylenol with codeine tablets if you bring me the. Well, those are not much. There's not much control on those, so the doctor could get all of those he wanted. So that was, he was able to, to to do that. But that shows his kind of versatility. I think was that well, if there was a problem with one source or one angle or one line or whatever, that he he could move to another line. He could move to another source and 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 still produce the product that uh, he was flexible about. And so I, that was one of the things that uh, made him so dangerous in, as, a, as a clandestine chemist was that he had the ability to think outside the box and move outside the box and, and create uh, without these uh, limitations that a lot of other lesser, lesser minds or whatever would, ha would have had. Yeah, he was incredibly brilliant that way, as you pointed out. He he would move from one source to another and follow the chemical chain and pull that next alternative up and use it and continue to use it. The other thing he would do as well is he would find uh, physical uses or physical ways to draw that chemical compound out and, and keep himself safe while doing it uh, or find a physical way to uh, draw those chemical compounds out that was maybe a little unorthodox. Uh, it, just fascinating stuff or, or ways to get, the other part of this too is is ways to get the equipment he needed to draw these chemical compounds out. He started to boost equipment from different colleges at one point. Yeah, he got kicked out of high school for, for truancy uh, in, in the last week of his, his senior year. Uh, they kicked him out for for not attending, and the same weekend he won the Wisconsin State Science Fair. So that shows a little of his, you know, his talent and ability, which he clearly wasn't applying in school, but he had the ability to to do it and and apply it in other areas. And what he did was he went over to uh, Marquette University, and uh, and became a, la a laboratory, got hired on as a laboratory assistant. And he took over their chemistry lab and used that to produce LSD and um, mescaline and other other hallucinogens. At the time, those weren't illegal. This was the early 1960s. It was actually before the big hippie era. And he produced these hallucinogens. They were legal at the time. Uh, but he didn't have a market for him. He was mostly doing it just for experimentation. He he did send a batch to Timothy Leary, who was a big LSD pr promoter at the time, and um, and he he uh, eventually tried to develop a market for him when the government banned them, and then people were making. But at the time, he was running up uh, using the the lab to make the hallucinogens, but he was also going from lab to lab, uh, getting access to their equipment and stealing electronic equipment 
laboratory equipment and gear and whatever and selling it. And that was his source of income because he wasn't making any money off of selling drugs at the time. He was making it from from stealing equipment, which is what first landed him in, in prison. One of the funny things you mentioned in the book is that when he sent a, a batch of this LSD, which I guess was good stuff, um, and he had even at one point, didn't he form a relationship with somebody who knew Janis Joplin at, at uh, that he, point? Yeah, he, he went out to, to the West Coast after he got out of prison from this um, this equipment charge in Wisconsin. Uh, he went out to the West Coast, to San Francisco, and this would have been right after the Summer of Love in was that 68 mm -hmm. uh, he was out there and and he met Janis Joplin uh, the year before she died uh, provided LSD to her provided LSD to the Grateful Dead um, he was uh, supplying the Grateful Dead for a little while uh, they they had a chemist uh, by the name of Owsley Stanley uh, they called him Bear he was the king of LSD at the time but he was facing a federal charge and they kind of lost confidence in him and his ability so they were going to replace bear with squeak so that was going to be the, that was the plan and he went back to the midwest to uh, collect his gear and stuff and got busted again for for stealing some more hmm. uh, equipment and went to prison so that never came about but uh he was for a while there he looked like he was going to become the new lsd king out in uh, california you'd mentioned in the book that one of the things that kind of turned him off to the whole thing was he had he had given uh, he, he was kind of thrilled because he had given timothy leary this batch of lsd but then and and others but the the whole thing was it wasn't paying off because they just wanted more free you know these hippies wanted more free lsd yeah, they weren't he, paying for it yeah leary leary wanted it he said he said leary liked the uh sample that he sent but he would didn't want to pay for it he said this had some theory that of his that LSD should be free for everybody and he was like I declined that I wasn't going to go along with that philosophy <laughs> and and then he went out to, when he went out to California he said yeah everybody was taking drugs they were taking drugs like mad but nobody wanted to pay for him so he's those goddamn hippies they all want free drugs <laughs> he hated he hated that so well at least uh Squeak was a free market guy even in the summer oh yeah yeah, yeah. a capitalist yeah yes he was yeah you get you gotta admire him for that yeah, <laughs> he he was a he was a four forefront and forethinker as far as that goes, and and knowing that uh, you had to remain a capitalist in this business in order to survive. Although you know, it, it, kind of looking ahead, he never really was ultra rich uh, doing this. I mean, he kept his head above water, but you know, he was never swimming in money doing this thing, was he? No, not at all. He he was not, and I've talked with him multiple times about this motivation because i you know i work narcotics and narcotics traffickers they're in it for the money i mean they're taking big risks for big money and he was willing to take the risks but he really wasn't interested in the money so much he was more interested in the chemistry so people say well he's like walter white well no he really wasn't like walter was in it for the money and and then it got even darker but um but he was squeak was he was interested in it for the for the chemistry he liked he liked doing things that nobody else could do or would do and and he was more interested in that he never he never showed off the flash or the uh the, he didn't buy he always drove a crummy old truck and every time i ever encountered him back in the day he was driving some old pickup truck and he wore sloppy clothes and didn't didn't dress up and um uh, no no uh, real estate big houses or swimming pools or anything it just didn't interest him and uh, what he wanted to do was have enough money so that he could keep uh, busy in his lab working on projects that interested him and that was his that was his thing for his whole life yeah it's interesting that there's uh it, between the pictures in the book and your your descriptions of different chapters in in the book you can definitely tell he's he's a dressed down kind of guy you you describe flannel shirts and overalls and you know stocking caps and there's different pictures in the book that you're like this is not the guy i imagine you know when you're thinking of a guy who you know is getting you know getting along between city to city or settling down but he's very much a down to earth kind of guy who you, you would blend in in any midwestern town would blend in anywhere in the south would blend in anywhere he would be and you'd never assume that he was, you know, 
dealing that kind of weight. That's for sure. Yeah, he was very familiar with the way law enforcement worked. He, he Originally, he came to our attention in Oklahoma when I was working as an agent at the Oklahoma Bureau of Narcotics. Uh, he came to our attention as an informant. He came uh, to one of the agents with a, a, st a story about an individual that was making methamphetamine in, in Oklahoma City. And he became an informant for us. And every time I ever saw him, and I met him in 1976, and every time I ever saw him in 76 and 77, 78, uh, he was, he always just looked like your basic down home dude and not a, not a character that you'd really spend any time. You think now that's not the biggest meth manufacturer in Oklahoma, not by, not by any means. And uh, always uh, very casually dressed. He knew how law enforcement worked. He worked with us as an informant for, well, man, a year and a half. And so he, he knew how we operated and he knew how to keep off, off of our radar to some extent. And, and it worked for him for a long time. He kept him out of trouble for quite, quite, quite a long time. I'll tell you what, John, we're going to take our break here. When we come back, I want to talk a little bit about what led up to you all running into him in Oklahoma and getting him eventually as an informant. Um, he dabbled in LSD, but then he also decided to take that turn, which got him, uh, you know, heroin, LSD, eventually getting him into your sites there. We'll talk about what hit, got him into your sites there in Oklahoma. We'll talk about the unique relationship in Oklahoma, because there's a very interesting relationship informant and what he did for you guys there in Oklahoma. And we'll also talk about what turns squeak onto fentanyl and the morality of fentanyl with squeak. It's very interesting. What makes him turn the corner and decide to start playing with it? It's an interesting morality play here, John. I, you know, when we talk about weighing life and death and what's, what makes people make certain decisions, when you talk about fame versus, um, you know, in a career wanting to be known, because I don't think most people, if you say the name George Eric Marquardt, he's not a household name, right? Um, if you say the name, uh, if you say his name out there, if you're to say, if, do you know who the godfather of fentanyl is? Most people don't know who he is. And, and I think, uh, you know, to have put a product like that out on the market, was it worth it? I think I'm going to ask you that question when we come back. So uh, the book is lethal doses, the story behind the godfather of fentanyl. John Mattinger is our guest folks. You got to get this book. It is so incredibly fascinating to read about this metamorphosis of this incredibly dangerous drug and how the beginnings of this all started. John Mattinger, again, our guest during the break, go get the book. When we come back, we'll talk more about squeak and we'll talk about how the relationship, uh, the metamorphosis of this relationship happened with uh, Oklahoma and how eventually he gets into fentanyl. We'll do that when we come back right here on the best in true crime podcasting. This is true crime Tuesday. Welcome back to the best in true crime podcasting. This is true crime Tuesday. I'm your host, Tim Dennis. My guest is John Mattinger. The guest or the uh, book rather is lethal doses. The story behind the godfather of fentanyl. We're talking about George Eric Marquardt. He's known as squeak. He's a subject of this book and he is godfather of fentanyl. Uh, before we left everybody, John, we were talking about how you and your agency ran into Squeak, uh, as we had been talking about in the previous segment. He had been dealing in LSD. He had been dealing in heroin. He had been doing other things. He had been doing other drugs. And I think even he tried to master a, a drug called TMA at one point. Uh, can you tell people what TMA is? Yeah, uh, TMA is 2,4,5-trimethoxyamphetamine. It's called, usually called TMA. Uh, it's uh, it's an as methamphetamine or an amphetamine derivative. Uh, it 
he thought that it was going to be the drug of the future because it had properties that were sort of hallucinogenic and it also had those same properties as methamphetamine. So it was like the best of both worlds. For him. And he, it hadn't been out on the street at all. He did manufacture it in Oklahoma. It was um, a little after it was in 78 when he started manufacturing it for, for, for real, he was trying to make a bunch of it. And um, he said, he tried some himself. He always tried to do a little of the, of each of his uh, drugs that he worked with just to, to make sure he wasn't going to kill everybody and, and uh, to, to make, see what the effects were. He wasn't a big drug user. He didn't mm. normally use drugs, uh, but he tried to, he said, yeah, I knew this was going to be good when I saw the windows of the car melting. So oh, it was, uh, it was, <laughs> that was his attraction to it. And, um, we we found him. We he came to us actually at, at OBN in 1975, after he hooked up with uh, another guy in Oklahoma called Bob Harris, and Harris was was making methamphetamine, and methamphetamine. There was a market for meth in Oklahoma at the time, so it wasn't like LSD where he, people didn't want to pay for it, and he could actually make money from making meth and support his other research and interests by getting meth money. And so he hooked up with Harris and they started a lab and then he went out one weekend and came back and the lab was gone. And Harris had, had figured, well, I'd know enough about this to do it myself and I'll just do it and took all of the stuff. And he was very annoyed. He went to, to OBN uh, and said, I think I know where you can find a lab. And and sure enough, the agents went there and they, to Harris's house in Oklahoma City and found found the lab. So um, that was how he bec he became an informant for us. And that was how I initially met him. Was uh, he was continued to work with us throughout 1976, and I met him in late '76, um, and he. We had we were going to do an undercover operation in in Oklahoma City area, and we were going to set up a laboratory supply store and sell chemicals to shady characters and follow the chemicals back to the to the lab. And they wanted me to be the undercover agent because I was pretty new, wasn't from Oklahoma, didn't know a lot of people, and and I said, well, yeah, okay, I I'll do it, but I don't. I don't know anything about chemistry. I didn't take chemistry in college. You know, you, that's not going to be the one to be able to tell you what chemicals go with what chemicals to do something. Um, and so they said, don't worry, you, we've got somebody that can t teach you everything you need to know. Hmm. And that's how I met Squeak for the first time was he was going to be our informant for that project. What's, what's interesting too is, is, the, the, you guys tried to keep it from him a little bit as to what the project was at the beginning, and he knew within 10 minutes what, what it was yeah, he, you guys were trying to do. Yeah, he figured it out right away. He said, you, you guys are setting up a trick store. And I go, yeah, because I wasn't supposed to tell him that. He said, don't tell him that we're going to do this. You know, just, just tell him you need to know how to do clandestine chemistry. And I said, okay. And so I, we talked for a little while, and he goes, you're setting up a trick store. You're going to pull people in. And he really liked the idea because, you know, it was going to – he thought anybody that was dumb enough to fall for our plan and me was deserved what they got. And so he was really enthusiastic participant up to a point uh, in early 77, after he testified at Harris's trial, uh, he took off and disappeared on us and went up to the West coast. And we sort of had to cancel this the undercover operation because we didn't know where he was or who he told or whatever. So he went up to the West coast and was, making meth and sending it back down to Tulsa. And uh, eventually he came back to Oklahoma and set up a lab in Beggs, which is a little town south of Tulsa. And that was where he was manufacturing TMA and and methamphetamine. And we, we busted him, OBN busted him on January of 1978. And that was really the key to the fentanyl thing, which nobody realized at the time because uh, he got convicted on that. He got 10 years and they sent him 
first to Leavenworth, and then they transferred him to Lewisburg. And Lewisburg at the time was the sort of the east, they called it the East Coast Mafia uh, home prison for the mafia because all of the major mobsters from New York, New Jersey, and Philadelphia, and Boston, wherever, they, they sent them all to, to Lewisburg. And he was housed in, on J Block, which was the Mafia Row. That's where all the mafiosi were uh, were housed. And he he was housed next door to, or just down the hall from, uh, Louis Cirillo. And and he when he told me that, I was later on. I went to talk to him later about it, and he said, "Yeah, I was there with Louis Cirillo." And I said, "Do you know Louis Cirillo?" And he goes, "Yeah, he was right down the hall from me in uh, Lewisburg." Because I knew Louis Cirillo, and every narcotics agent in America knew Louis Cirillo because he was considered to be the biggest heroin dealer in the country at the time. Yeah. Yeah. And so what you had is a situation where you've got this extremely dangerous, um, completely amoral, conscienceless, brilliant chemist in prison next door to the biggest heroin dealer in the country. So when Louis Cirillo comes to him in January of 81 and says with a Newsweek magazine article, and he says, what is, he shows them the Newsweek article and he says, is this real? Or is this more cop bullshit? He says this, um, he looked at the article and it was an article about uh, the uh, China white, a fentanyl analog that was on the street in California and it killed a bunch of addicts in, in 1980 and they'd finally identified it and it was wasn't fentanyl but it was close to fentanyl it was one of the analog cousins of fentanyl mm -hmm. and and Louis was interested because he's looking at this thing and he's saying and the article is saying you can use two thousand dollars to make these chemicals in a lab in wherever in the United States and then you don't need heroin anymore you don't need all of that you could replace the entire American heroin trade with, with fentanyl. And so he didn't know squeak didn't know because he'd never, never messed with fentanyl before first time he'd heard of it. And he said, well, yeah, you know, when he, he did a little research and talked to some friends outside and, and he came back to him and said, yeah, this is potentially real. You know, you could actually, this is actually possible. So then Louis Cirillo wanted to know, can you do it? And his response was, if it's in the literature, I can do it. And and that was his um, that was his introduction to fentanyl. He realized he could do it, but then he also realized how dangerous it was too, right? I mean, he oh yeah, he started to go through the actual you know mock up of it and went, wow, this this is a dangerous compound. Like I could kill myself on this. Yeah, and he almost did. He almost did when he was manufacturing it. He did passed out and wake up on the floor and he said uh he didn't really know even know how it had happened but he, he knew that it was extremely dangerous um he he also knew and he said to this to all of the people that he was associated with throughout the conspiracy over the next few years uh he said there's no possible way to cut this safely there's no way that you can make this uh safe for, for consumption without having uh overdose deaths and he said, I have no idea what the lethal dosage is for this, for this drug. We can make it. It's definitely feasible. It's possible to do, but I don't know what the bottom line is going to be as far as the, as far as what it takes to get people high, what it takes to kill people. I don't know what that, what that is. He's not a pharmacologist, mm -hmm. but he's looking at it and he's doing it. Okay. I, there's just no way that in a street situation that these people are going to be able to cut this successfully without giving a bunch of what well, they call them hot shots where they're fatal, fatal, um, you know, dosage. Uh, there's just no way that you can prevent that with fentanyl. And that's what we're seeing today. I mean, there's just no way that you can, you can keep the regularly keep the dosages down to under two milligrams, which is the estimated lethal dose for for fentanyl and that's what we're seeing today it's why so many people are overdosing is because it's just so difficult to control that you're dealing in such small tolerances 
uh, with the drugs that it's it's really hard to get a uh, to to master that to 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 make it any kind of safe. So it, you know, I, I on a side note here, John, I when my grandmother was alive, she had um, she had a broken spine. She had she had osteoporosis all the way through her spine, and they used to give her fentanyl patches. I don't know if you remember these fentanyl patches. And I, I as well, I have a broken neck and broken spine. So uh, not too long ago, I went to my pain clinic and I said, do you still do the fentanyl patches? And they looked at me and they laughed and they said, we haven't done those in probably 10, 15 years. Because what they used to do is, again, the small small dealers would take and get a hold of these fentanyl patches. They would be, they would, and then they would take the fentanyl out of the patches. And they'd manufacture uh, fentanyl pills out of those. Right. See, fentanyl was originally developed in, in the late 1950s, patented in 1960 by Janssen Pharmaceutical, or Janssen Pharmaceutical in Belgium. And it was patented as a an anesthetic. And it was it was licensed in, in the United States by FDA or allowed in, in as an anesthetic. In 1968, I think was the, the year, and and for the next 20 years, even even the next 25 years, it was it was strictly approved only for anesthesia. So you had a you know have a surgical situation where somebody's knocked out, and the anesthesiologist anesthesiologist is standing right there administering it, and so the opportunity for abuse was pretty limited. You know, there wasn't it didn't get out in the public. It was only in the hands of the pharmacist and the anesthesiologist. Mm -hmm. Anesthesiologist, 90% of the anesthesiologists who were treated for addiction in that time period were addicted to fentanyl because that's what they had access to. Yeah. So in, in the early, I want to say early 2000s, the FDA approved it as a long uh, chronic for chronic pain. And they approved it in the form that you just mentioned, in the form of patch. And they've subsequently developed a they call it a lollipop, but you, it basically a way of slowly releasing the drug into your system. You don't get a big jolt of it all at one time. When Squeak was busted in '93, and the and the fentanyl overdoses stopped in America, they began to ramp up again in uh, the early 2000s because of just what you said. There was more access to fentanyl. People had access to pharmaceutical fentanyl, fentanyl citrate, on the on the street. They could get it with in the form of these patches and and extract the fentanyl from it, and then shoot the fentanyl up. And then that was causing overdoses. Those overdoses continued until um, the about 2014, 2015, when they call it uh, non-pharmaceutical fentanyl, NPF, uh, hit the street, and that's clandestinely manufactured overseas, mostly in uh, Mexico. So that was the sort of timeline of fentanyl. It started out as a pure anesthetic, very valuable in anesthesia. The heart, heart people say that it would be impossible to do uh, modern heart procedures without it because it doesn't depress blood pressure. It has a, a quick onset and a very uh, fairly quick uh, recovery time. Mm -hmm. So it's really good for patients. You know, it's very good for surgery. It's on the World Health Organization's list of essential medicines, something that we can't live without. But um, but it began that way, and then it evolved when it was uh, briefly, he was the only person manufacturing street fentanyl, then that was what was causing the ODs. And the next phase, it was the the diversion from these patches and whatever, where it was out in, more out in the public. And now we're, it's almost exclusively, I mean, 100% of it is, is non-pharmaceutical fentanyl manufactured clandestinely. So it, it's such a fine line that it's such a fine line between what's acceptable pharmaceutically and what's street fentanyl and why fentanyl is getting such a bad name because right now you say the word fentanyl and the American public thinks bad. They, they, they just, they, they think it's a recreational 
drug. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many people go, oh, I don't want that when they when they go to the doctor because they think street drug. And they don't realize the the, you know, I I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard from from nurses and doctors that are friends that they say we don't even mention to a patient or we try not to mention to it that we're using fentanyl. But when we say it to them, they go, no, 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 it's not the same stuff that you hear about on the news. It's a, it's, you know, it's pharmaceutical, it's, it has its uses and they have to explain that it's not the tablet form that you see, you know, that looks like candy in a bag that, that the DEA has captured from the border because it's gotten such a bad rap from all these different media reports that they're getting. And, and it seems like there's this big hodgepodge of, of a mess of different reports of, of people popping street drugs or it's why the big mess here, John? Well, the, the traffickers have, have seen a way to, to do what Louis Cirillo wanted to do back in the day, which was to replace the heroin trade the heroin trade you know you grow the poppies in afghanistan which is a long way away and it gets processed into morphine somewhere in some other place and gets moved to pakistan or wherever and and eventually it is trafficked all the way to to the united states across the southern border through the ports of entry or whatever and so that's a long process which you can eliminate in one step just make make the fentanyl um they've the, the problem with the, the current problem is, is that a lot of people, and, and this is why I think fentanyl is such a game changer in terms of the, the war on drugs. The, the, the problem is, is that the, you get people that are using heroin, that are using, they're taking fentanyl now, they're as a substitute for heroin, they're heroin addicts, and, and those are the standard traditional typical junkie that people think about um but you also get these people that are taking oh i've got a back pain i'm going to take a you know i my doctor won't give me a oxycodone or won't give me a vicodin so i'm gonna you know i've got joe down the street has some vicodin and and you sure enough it looks like a vicodin but it he doesn't know that that contains lethal dose of fentanyl and he's not an addict. He's a home guy. He just has a problem with his back. And this is killing a lot of people. Yeah. And and it's almost an accidental uh, poisoning. So, I mean, they're not intentionally taking seeking out fentanyl, but they're but they're getting it. So, to me, that that's why this is a game changer. Is because it's it's affecting people that are not your standard traditional junkies, not that they deserve to die either, but, but people that, that don't understand necessarily the risk. And it's totally different in a hospital setting where, you know, you go in there and you've got an anesthesiologist sitting there, right? Right. I've had two surgeries in the last two years, both times I was, they gave me fentanyl mm -hmm. um, and I was glad to get it. You know, I don't want to be conscious and in pain while I'm being operated on. Right. So, um, you know, so it's, it, it was the beneficial good thing that, you know, is the reason why it's on the world health organization's list. Um, but, but you've also got this, this problem with the counterfeit drugs and the, and the fentanyl powder, which there's no way to, to regulate the, the dose unless, um, you know, unless you're getting the you're you're getting the pharmaceutical stuff, there's no way to, to regulate the, the dose on the street. And it's the tolerance between what they call an effective dose, which is what it takes to knock you out and for surgery or to to get you high if that's what you're taking it for. The effective dose and the difference between that and the lethal dose is really pretty fine. We're talking about milligrams, milli, uh, thousands of a gram. Um, you know, the, the weight of a grain or two of salt. So when you look at that, um, it's in overdoses are going to be inevitable. It's going to be one of those things where you, you, it's going to happen no matter what you, no matter how you try to educate, it's going to be really, really difficult to um, establish 
uh, what you've got and what you're taking and what the effect is going to be very, very, very hard in a, in a setting black market setting like this. And that's why I think it's a game changer myself. I think we're going to have to come up with some other solution because it's killing people that shouldn't be killing. And, and you pointed it out yourself. There's, there's counterfeit pills out there. I mean, there's, uh, I, myself, I'm a chronic pain patient and I, I get prescribed morphine. So, and, but there's counterfeit morphine pills out there. Um, I think it was a counterfeit morphine pill that killed Prince, if I remember right. Um, or it was, uh, no, it was counterfeit Vicodin. That's what it was. He was looking for counterfeit Vicodin. Um, but as you pointed out, there's counterfeit Vicodin, there's counterfeit um, um, perks out there. There's, there's everything that, that people are looking for, because again, they, doctors aren't prescribing that for, for basic stuff. Um, but the, the, the question I think a lot of people have is, is why are people or why are our dealers cutting these these counterfeit pills with with fentanyl and and that brings us right back to the story which is this and and we're, I want to get back to this this question and that's this in the story and that's there's a, a part in the story where uh squeak is is faced with this dilemma and he realizes that it only takes just this, as you just pointed out so eloquently, it only takes just a fine amount. And basically it knocks out not only pain, but it knocks you out, you know, boom, he has this incident in the lab. And he's realizing that there's going to be a lot of deaths. And he and he's warning his associates, there's going to be a lot of deaths. It's going to happen. If we put this out on the street, you can't cut this stuff. It, it just... You know, you can step on it so many times, like, and when we say step on it, for those who don't know, so you've got your pure product, which you make, but then you've got to use different types of fillers. And what types of fillers do they use with, with this, um, with this uh, product? Uh, Manitol is one. It's a laxative, baby laxative. It's white powder. Uh, Inositol is another one that, that is, is used. You can buy these sort of like vitamins or supplements. And they're, they're not hard to get. Any kind of, um, they used, at one point, they used a sugar. So it was, um, you, you can cut it with almost anything. The problem is, is that unless you use pretty high-tech equipment, and they had one of those, they had a rotary evaporator, which is can be used to mix, to mix substances in a relatively safe way, but they didn't use it, and eventually they threw it in Boston Harbor. Um, the unless you have that you're going to get hot spots inside your your package you're going to get when they package it up in these little um die, they call them dime bags little pa plastic packages um that you're going to get some that have one milligram or that have some that have two milligrams some of them will have four you know you just never know it's like playing russian roulette and you just never know if you're getting one that has the the lethal dose in it or not and that's and he he was well aware of that and he warned his the people hey there's no way that you can you can do this the way you've done this in the past there's no way that you can cut this safely i'm just and and he knew that it was going to cause cause problems um, he knew it was going to cause deaths so february 1991 he and his associates put it out on the street right for the first time yeah under the name tango and cash well, it was produced, yeah, they just produced the powder. It was given to some dealers in um, the Bronx, New York, New York City. And they put it out under, in these uh, small dime bags, packages, forty about 40 milligrams of powder. And uh, sold it out in, in the Bronx in the first, first day of February in 1991. And that was the first official introduction to the American public of fentanyl under what users thought they were getting was heroin right but it wasn't it was it was fentanyl and when you would go to test it or when authorities would go to test it it came up with no narc no narcotic narcotic value but it came up as fentanyl correct it did it came up as they they found that it was an average of four milligrams of fentanyl per bag which is twice the lethal dose of of um, 
fentanyl for for the average person. Jeez. So this was kind of an experiment. I mean, I hate to put it this way, but it was kind of an experiment for them because this they didn't know. And he warned them this, too. He said, you know, I don't know what it's going to do. I don't know how much it's going to take to get somebody high. I don't know how much it's going to take to to kill them. So their first estimate was I think they produced uh, 50, 50 grams of of pure pure fentanyl. And they cut that with nine hundred and fifty grams of of cut or filler material. So they had a kilo, basically kilogram of fentanyl mix. And but they did it in the, the standard traditional way, which was a bucket and some some strainers and some spatulas and whatever. And they cut it just like they would have done heroin. And uh, and that wasn't nearly in, uh, enough to prevent overdose deaths and sure enough 12 people died in the first two days and there are about 20 more in the next couple of weeks so it was a lot of people that it was it was a disaster for the uh, for the street drug market in new york city um, but it was a big success for the group for the conspiracy because now they had a better idea about how to how to dilute it how much uh, how much cut they needed to put into it to, to reduce the the fatalities and create that repeat business that all the drug traffickers are looking for. But at that same time, they brought the heat down on themselves because now the entire spotlight of the federal government is on them because now they know um, you, you just, oh, yeah. you just, you just introduced a brand new product that, that um, I, I mean, it, they, they brought a blowtorch to, uh, you know, to a fist yeah. fight. And Squeak and Squeak said he said I I knew the DEA was never going to stop because if I that because if they didn't get us they were going to have to deal with this again and again which is exactly what's happening now so yeah it's if they DEA went all out from that point on to try and find this I mean it was their it was their number one priority case in the entire country. So they were trying hard to find the people behind this before more people died. And they couldn't. I mean, it took two years for them to find because he was operating out of a 620 square foot shack in Wichita, Kansas. And they had nobody had any idea where the lab was until very late in the investigation. And once they found it, they were able to get to the lab and, and stop it. But um, for two years, they were the only source of fentanyl in America. It's amazing. It's amazing. The book is amazing itself. Lethal Doses, the story behind the godfather of fentanyl. Before we leave people today, John, what's interesting is I'm based out of Minnesota here, out of the Twin Cities, but there's a story about Faribault, Minnesota. And it's <laughs> it's one of the more hysterical stories where there's a there's a part in the book where Squeak is with his girlfriend and I believe her brother is that is that the the case right yeah yeah and, Rex and Carla yeah and and they're they're uh, they're traveling from the West Coast and they're trying to make a getaway out of the West Coast and and they're having a bit of a road trip and they're they're going from campground to campground and they're evading the law and and Squeak is kind of looking at it in a romantic type of way because in his words. Uh, if, if this life isn't about, uh, you know, making drugs and, and evading the law and, and having a romantic look at, at things, then, then what is life really about? And so somehow he ends up in Faribault, Minnesota, and he has a bit, it, it, it kind of comes to an end for him here in Minnesota, but I guess we didn't do the best job of, of serving him with a search warrant, <laughs> the Minnesota, uh, Bureau of Criminal yeah. Apprehension. Um, and I guess it all fell apart here. Yeah, he was, um, he was being chased at the time by, by OBN, o Oklahoma Bureau of Narcotics sent two agents up to the West coast to try and find him because we knew he was sending speed back down to, to Tulsa and, and he found out that they were after him and that his, uh, one of his distributors had been arrested in Wichita. And so he took off and they went to by car across the northern tier and and into Minnesota. And they stopped in uh, at first they stopped in Albert Lee, which I guess is south of Faribault. Yep. Um, 
and they he set up a lab wherever he stopped he set up a lab so that he'd make some drugs and and uh, ship them out to Minnesota, to uh, Oklahoma and they they had a lab in the basement of a feed mill in Albert Lee and he he said that they had a problem with one of the the tenants i assume this is the story you're referring to mm-hmm. and and the um uh, tenant was uh, somebody that was uh, involved in duck hunting it's, i guess that's a popular pastime in minnesota oh yes yep and and he had all his duck decoys there in the in the basement of the feed mill which was supposed to be rented exclusively by squeaks so they had a sort of i don't know a landlord tenant or a tenant tenant dispute and he decided it was time to get out so but before he left he decided he'd leave this guy a little present and he and his he and his partner he said they they wrecked a, a couple of the ducks by the decoys by sawing the heads off and turning it on backwards and then they put chemicals on some of the other ones so that they were basically you know nasty smelling and and yucky and and then he said he said that was i thought that was kind of juvenile and i said something to him about that and he goes yeah and the the other one wasn't so funny and he said we we drilled out one of the ducks and put in um an ounce or two of metallic sodium well metallic sodium is something that they call they say chemists say reacts violently with water mm-hmm. so and a duck that is a duck decoy's natural habitat isn't it uh, yes water yep so i said that would make a memorable start to the duck season because it would blow up the the duck pretty <laughs> spectacularly uh and then he moved up to Faribault. He he moved his operation up to Faribault, and he rolled his pickup truck uh and was was put in the hospital and they discovered the makings of a drug lab in the pickup truck and the deputies the sheriff deputies went to his uh, apartment or motel room in Faribo and basically conducted an illegal search of the of the room there and found some stuff they found most of a lab they didn't find any meth He'd finished a batch and it was somewhere else and but but it was none of it was admissible they couldn't use any of it so he was uh he was for one of the was one of the first time or one of the only times in his life he actually talked to a lawyer he talked to a lawyer in in Faribo and they, the lawyer said now nah, you don't have anything to worry about this is going away and so he he uh after he got out of the hospital uh, he headed back down to Oklahoma, which is where we got him in bags early 78. And that started the whole uh, fentanyl chain, you know, where he gets busted in bags and goes to Lewisburg and meets Louis Cirillo. But my, my question would be, well, what if they hadn't, what if they'd done, done it right and got the, got the search warrant and yeah. executed the search warrant on the place and he'd have been locked up in Minnesota. I mean, this would have been a big deal in little Faribault, you yep. know, have a big meth trafficker in, in Faribault and probably would have got some time in, in Stillwater. Know, in Stillwater. And, yep. and, you know, he never would have met Louis Cirillo in Lewisburg and we never would have had the fentanyl issue. And he would, you know, have what, what if, what if, one of those situations where history could have been changed by little Farabo, Minnesota. That's right. Yeah. If they would have followed the letter of the law, got the search warrant, then he yeah. would, the two of them would have never met and there yeah. would have been the, uh, the big fentanyl outbreak. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to put too much on the sheriff's stuff. Yeah. I did that for a little while and you know, I mean, stuff happens, but uh, you just wonder if man was, we could have avoided this whole thing. You know? No, you're <laughs> right. If, <laughs> right. It, it, you're right. But it, it was probably, you know, it was one of those things where they thought they had the bust of the century and they, they got, you know, they got all hot to want to get it and they, they didn't follow procedure. So, yeah, I'm sure they got uh, reamed out by their boss, but that yeah, yeah. I'm sure that, that there were some recriminations over that at the time, yeah. the BCA got the, got all the lab, they sent all the lab equipment up to the BCA and BCA said that, that that was what they would expect to see in a whole year of of methamphetamine labs. So 
mean, it was a pretty significant operation, and um, yeah, it it could have been different. Things could have been different. Yeah, yeah. I I was uh, I was surprised because it, to read that chapter because it, now I think the BCA runs a tighter ship. I I, I know I know a lot of different municipalities uh, run a tighter ship, especially here in the Twin Cities area. Keep in mind for people who are listening that are from out of state, um, you know, Faribault is is much further south from the uh, from the Twin Cities metro area. I mean, it's it's a couple hour journey, but um, but it's to, to, you know, I mean, it, and it's a rural area. So, I mean, it, you know, to, to, uh, and, and not that that's any excuse or anything like that, but. At the well, time, his, his, it, it's not surprising that he would be in someplace like Albert Lee or Faribault because he knew that those places have less sophisticated police departments. Yeah. And he was taking advantage of that. I mean, like I say, he was, he was pretty pretty aware of how we operated and he knew that chances that bca or some other state agency or dea or some of the more specialized would have agencies would have a presence in a place like that he would be dealing with small town police officers or small county sheriff's de deputies and so you know there's a reason why he was in Beggs. there was a reason why he was in Faribault. there's yeah. a reason why his labs were in places like that because he was sophisticated enough to know that hey this is my this is the quality of opposition that i want to be lined up against and right and so you know it paid off for him that time yeah i was just sure. going to say considering the year in the you know yeah. in the product that he's dealing it's it makes sense that that's where he would be set up i mean he wasn't going to go to minneapolis minnesota in that year and and try right. a, a meth right, right. So, yeah right he was going to go to somewhere like albert lee or or Faribault. so that, that makes complete sense the book is lethal doses the story behind the godfather of fentanyl john mattinger i want to thank you so much for being on the program today that again fascinating book uh i i I absolutely enjoyed it. I, I, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's, uh, there's books that come along that you, you read and you, you're absolutely blown away by that, that you read and you go, I had no idea, you know, that, that this chapter in history happened, it happened this way and it absolutely opened your eyes to, to history. And I absolutely was blown away by this book. I want to thank you so much for writing it. Well, it's my pleasure. I'm glad to glad to have a chance to talk with you. I'm I'm absolutely glad that you came on the show. I, I, it was my pleasure indeed, John. Thank you so much. Sure, anytime. Thank you, uh, folks. It's time now for us to lighten things up a bit. It's time now to bring in Jessica Freeberg, and it's time now for dumb crimes and stupid criminals. It's it's crayon news story time. What happened with this dude, Christ Bearer? I heard he. Uh cut his penis off and then jumped off a balcony. Suspect pulls gun from butt, shoots twice at Denver police. What is your emergency? I need help. And what's the problem? I'm too high. You're too high? Yeah. It's that time, the time to do all we look at. Well, it's time enough for dumb crimes and stupid criminals. And with that, we bring in our co-host. She's intelligent, she's witty, she's funny, and you better have bought her book by now, gosh darn it, because she's by now a New York Times bestselling author. Here she is, Jessica Freeberg. Hi, Jess. Hey, Tim. I love your enthusiasm. Well, you got you to gotta stay in the positive on this thing, right? So, yeah, let's manifest that, right? That's right. We're manifesting New York Times <laughs> bestselling author. I put it out there. It's got to happen. It's happening. I can feel it. It's happening. It's happened right now. It's happened already. I mean, you know, just <laughs> look for the email from your publisher. That's right. It was an Amazon bestseller before it even released. And I think that is really thanks to everyone who pre-ordered. That was so kind of all of you. So thank you. That's all right. You're on your way, kid. <laughs> See, that's that's how it happens. Just saying. That's right. It's First it's Amazon, then it's Wall Street Journal, then it's New York Times, then it's a world. That's right. Taking over the world. That's right. Then One monster book at a time. That's the Hindustan Times bestseller. Um, I don't know what that has to do with anything. I don't either, but whatever. I don't know. I don't know. 
I think because one of the stories is from the Hindustan Times, I think this week. I have no idea. I just threw that in there. Let's get to our story, shall we? We are do it. We are packed today. And and when I say packed, I think that has to do with the not safe for work part of our program. Oh no. Which is extensive today. I'm not gonna lie. You gotta brace yourself here, Jess. It is I I know some of our audience is gonna love this, but we'll leave that for that part of the program. First, I wanna I wanna start with an interesting story. Not necessarily dumb crime, stupid criminals, but everybody wants to own an axe murder house, right? Yeah, why not? I mean, you would think not only on the paranormal side of things, but on the true crime side of things, wouldn't you love to own an axe murder house and maybe get it for a bargain? Yeah, I don't know if I'd want to live there, but it'd be cool to own it. Sure. A vacation spot. You would think there's a lot of people that are looking for one for a bargain. This really? You're not going to get for a bargain, but it's in a great place. There's a place called the Davis Islands that's right in the Tampa, Florida area. Mm -hmm. That is a historic axe murder home. And it is gorgeous. Jess, I'm going to show you this real quick. Take a look at the exterior of this house. Ooh, yeah, I live there. Huh? That looks beautiful. Yeah. Now, wait till I tell you how much this house is going for. You're going to go, I'll pass. That's uh, that's passable. Um, now, a house like this in Florida is, even though it's gorgeous, it's a nice house. You think, oh, okay, you know, five, six hundred thousand, right? I mean, it's, it's it, it looks nice. This right. historic Tampa home was once the site of a horrendous axe-related homicide in the early 1960s. It's now for sale on Davis Islands. It's located at 51 Albemarle Avenue. The Mediterranean Revival Home was built in, in 1925 by famed developer D.P. Davis and was purchased in 1937 by the late Tampa businessman Burton H. Shep Sr. and his wife, Raina. Now, Burton was the former president of... I believe it's Tam Miami Trailways Bus Lines and was the chairman of the Florida Safety Council. Most notably, he ran unsuccessfully for governor in 1940 as an independent with a platform of opposing sales tax, uh, pushing for nine-month school years with year-round pay for teachers. You got to love that. And fighting against six-lane highways along the Gulf Coast. Pretty good so far, right? Now, the Sheps... Yeah. And their two sons lived in the Davis Island home for decades and were considering active or considerably active in, in Tampa social life. According to the numerous newspaper clippings, Reyna was an uh, accomplished floral designer and well-known around Tampa, often hosting extravagant birthday parties, luncheons, and events in the home. The Shep House was the weekly site of the Shakespeare Study Club. And in a 1954 article in the Tampa uh, Daily Times, Reyna was nominated by the local Hydrangea Garden Circle Club as the best cook this week. So evidently that was a place to go to eat. Yeah, sounds delicious. Right? However, in, or uh, rather on August 7th of 1963, the 61-year-old Reyna was arrested by Tampa police after Burton's body was discovered by a neighbor critically injured on a bloodstained mattress in his bedroom at the home. He did it. Evidently, he was on the menu. <laughs> no. Yeah. Yikes. I wasn't expecting her to be the culprit. I thought she'd be the victim. Right. You would think. Right. According to the Tampa Tribune, police said the or bedroom was splattered with blood and that the door had been chopped through with an axe. Oh, my gosh. This is like the Stanley Hotel. That's right. <laughs> she was Johnny before Johnny, if you know what I mean. Reports at the time show slightly different details of exactly what happened, but police told multiple outlets that when they entered the two-story house, Raina was standing at the top of the stairs in her nightgown holding an axe with her face and hands covered in dried blood. Wow, that is quite the visual. Nothing says guilty like your hands covered in dried blood holding an axe, <laughs> right? Besides the axe, police said they also found a butcher knife, a hammer, a broken shotgun, scissors, and a baseball bat, all blood-stained. Dang, she went to town. Yeah, girlfriend put in work. He must have really done something bad. He must have made her super mad. Well, I'm glad you're putting the onus back on him, Jess. I mean, <laughs> you know, why not? 
Uh, according to the Tribune, police said the entire house was a mess with evidence that someone had been chopping at the walls, woodworks, and doors. The rooms downstairs uh, as well, the officers said, were in disarray with bloody towels and dirty clothing scattered about. Oh, she just like lost her mind. Raina lost her shit. If you know yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah, she did. Uh, Raina told police that she broke down the door to her husband's bedroom after he scolded her for drinking. Oh. Uh, yes. No, that? No, no, dear. You mustn't drink anymore. Let me go get the axe. I had too much faith in Raina. I thought, oh, he must have had a girl on the side. No, he just asked her not to drink so much. And that no. was her reaction. No, no, dear. If you teetotal in the afternoon, that'd be <laughs> wonderful, please. I'm imagining him with a British accent. I like it. Yeah. Uh, and he also said that his, or rather, and said that his fatal injuries were a result of her pushing him down the stairs after he hit her with a baseball bat. Okay, so he was a little violent when it came to the drinking. Okay, I take that okay. back. He wasn't proper about it at all. He was like, stop drinking, boom, and hit her with a yeah, bat. Yeah, change your accent, Tim. All Don't right. make him so refined. Uh, stop drinking. Some reports indicate that she had a swollen area visible on her forehead. Ooh, he took it right to the, ooh, yikes. He went Babe Ruth on the forehead. <laughs> and I use Babe Ruth because he wasn't a nice man. Uh, some reports in, okay, I, I read that part. Uh, Burton died from his injuries the next day at Tampa General. So he survived. One of her sons later told police that his parents had not been getting along and that his mother was suffering from mental illness. Now, okay, time out. Anybody hit you with a baseball bat? I don't care what they're talking to you about. I don't care if it's, guess what, Jess, it's sunny and 75 outside. Whack! Um, yeah. You know, or hey, <laughs> quit your drinking. Whack! You just got hit with a baseball bat. Although we don't know when he hit her with the baseball bat to play devil's advocate. Maybe she had already attacked him with the ax and he was just defending himself. Okay. All right. All right. I'll give you that. Oh, okay. Uh, it's uncertain exactly what happened to Raina after she was charged. While the death was largely covered by papers around the country, the story disappeared from the media landscape, possibly due to the assassination of president John F. Kennedy a couple of months later. So, yeah. The story got lost in the media. Yeah. Now, as far as this home goes, by the way, Raina died in 1976 at the age of 74. Her and Burton now share a headstone at Myrtle Hill Memorial Park in Tampa. Oh. Hmm. Uh, rest, rest in pieces? Yeah. I guess. Right next to the person who killed you. Yeah. I don't know that they're necessarily in peace, but maybe pieces. Um. That home, by the way, is currently up for sale. That beautiful, beautiful, turmoiled home is for sale. <laughs> uh, the chef home is currently asking $1.675 million. Wow, that is a big price tag for a murder house. Yeah, it is. No break on that deal. You don't get a break. Dang. Listing agent is Jay Powell, Powell with Keller Williams, Tampa Central. If you're looking for a, maybe to talk him down a little bit, say, I think there might still be some old blood in the, uh, in the floor, floorboards. Oh, you know, there is. I mean, there was that show on, I can't remember what, what channel it was on, but there was like a murder house remodel show, which was like everything I love all collided into one show mm -hmm. and they would pull up like the floorboards and stuff. And there was always disgusting human matter remaining, no matter what house it was or how long ago the yeah. crime was. Yeah. So maybe you can talk them down hundred thousand, 200,000. I don't think they're going much further down than that. The, the housing market, even though there's a shortage of new homes, there's plenty of old homes to be sold. And yeah. I don't think I'm sure it's a great location though. I mean, being yes. on an island. Yeah. I think that I think they're uh they're probably gonna get what they're asking for. Though. Somebody will pay it. That's right. That's right. Let's stay in, in Florida. There's an alarming trend happening in Jacksonville. I, I want to say this is Jacksonville County. It's in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, this story 
It's more like uh, dumb crimes, stupid officers. Uh, a JSO officer has been arrested and accused of kidnapping with a firearm, stalking, and written threats to kill. Now, here's the alarming part of the story, Jess. 13 JSO employees have been arrested so far this year. What? Yeah. That's terrible. A little problem down there in Jacksonville, Florida. Now, an officer with Jacksonville Sheriff's Office was arrested Thursday in Nassau County and accused of multiple charges, including kidnapping with a firearm, written threats to kill or do bodily harm, and aggravated stalking. Jacksonville Sheriff T.K. Waters said, or held a news conference on Thursday evening to announce the serious and deplorable charges against current JSO officer, 42-year-old Brian Hausen. I wanted to be clear that this agency stands in solidarity with the victim of these horrible crimes. And I've said many times before, no one is above the law. No one, Waters said. The arrest of the officer marks the 13th employee of the agency to be arrested in 2024. That's not a good sign. No, 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 no. Uh, you know, one or two, you might have some bad apples. 13. 13. I think you got to look at the whole entire department. You need to hire a little better, I think. Yeah. Uh, Waters said Townsend was suspended and put on leave without pay and will eventually be fired. The charge of armed kidnapping is a first degree felony punishable by life in prison. He was being held on a million dollars bond. Waters declined to share details of the case. Listen to this, little Jen. Uh, Jen, Jess. Good God. I went to go say Town or Housand and Jen or Jess. Listen to me. Oh, forgive me, Jen. I can't it's say okay. my words today. Words is hard. Um, Waters declined to share details of the case against Housand, saying any information would come from the investigating agency, the Nassau County Sheriff's Office. A heavily redacted warrant for Housen made clear the charges involved a woman who was previously in a he was previously in a relationship with. So this obviously is a stalking charge um, having to do with someone that he was involved with. His accuser told investigators Housen sent her threatening emails and messages. Listen to this. Brian, you threatened to kill me. It is reasonable that I should not take you back. This was red acted. So, or it says red acted. Saw you take the rifle out of the gun safe that night in February when you hurt me. You can't undo that. One email from the victim to House and Ray or reads. The woman said on Tuesday, she saw what she believed to be a green laser shining into the window of her home and thought it was a kind of laser that could be attached to a gun. She said Hausen has a large collection of guns that he owns for personal and professional use. In another incident in July, the woman said Hausen came to her house uninvited in his marked JSO patrol car, wearing his uniform, and began banging on the back door. After an argument when the woman refused to get back with him, Hausen threatened to kill her and was snapping and unsnapping the holster carrying his service pistol in an overly threatening manner. She told that to investigators. The woman was able to record the incident on her phone, according to the warrant. Housen was originally hired by JSO in 2005, and since that date, Water said he left JSO to work for other agencies, and then he was rehired on two separate occasions. So they took him back. They probably shouldn't have done that. No. At one point, Housen became a lawyer and is still a member of the Florida Bar. What? So he can defend himself. Wow. Hmm. Waters said Hausen was involved in a few situations with internal affairs that didn't rise to the level of termination, but did not give details on those complaints. Evidently, Jacksonville's the place to be if you're not that great of a cop. <laughs> Just saying. I got this story from Tom. By the way, if you are a listener of uh, True Crime Tuesday and Dumb Crime Stupid Criminals and have a story for us, you can send it in to midarknessradio.com. This story from Rome, Georgia. A Rome woman is arrested for threatening to shoot up a school after failing a test. Never shoot up a school, folks. You, there's no excuse for shooting up a school, but for failing a test, especially bad reason. Victoria Jade Schaefer, all of 29 years old, of Rome, Georgia. Why is she threatened to shoot up a technical college? Oh, gosh. 
That tells you where she's she's sitting in life, folks. She was arrested this week after reports said she threatened to do meth and then shoot up the Georgia Northwestern Technical College. It was add a little meth on top of it. Yeah, well, you know, you you don't want to shoot up a technical college without a little something in you. I guess. Here's so, your fuel. Well, that's right. Report said that Schaefer told another student, I failed, makes me want to do meth again, makes me want to shoot up the school. Oh. Be better. Yeah. Why <laughs> yeah. are those your thoughts? Both terrible thoughts. Right. How about want to grab some McDonald's and go contribute to charity? Yeah. Or get yourself a pint of ice cream and cry. I mean, yeah. there's a better option. You're sad. There's we get it. Yeah. yeah. There you go. Meth and murder, not the answer. Right, not the not the answer. Thank, thank you, Jess. Schaefer is charged with felony terroristic threats and acts, as she should be. Let's move on. Uh, this story is kind of kind of very very stupid and fits our topic perfectly. Cops bust a furious New York City driver accused of stealing a tow truck with his own pickup attached. In other words, his pickup was being towed. He stole the tow truck. Jess, what's the worst thing you've done to ever stop your vehicle from being towed? I mean, I've only had it towed when it's breaking down, so I'm only grateful when the tow truck comes. Same here. Yeah. Here's the story. A suspect has been arrested over the now viral video of an enraged driver stealing a tow truck, hauling away his pickup, then crashing it into multiple cars. Well, his dad defended him Friday, saying he was convinced he was getting robbed. Oh, come on. 55-year-old Russell Leosa was slapped with multiple charges, including robbery, grand larceny, auto, reckless endangerment, leaving the scene of an accident, and 11 counts of property damage for the September 6th mayhem in Sunset Park. That's New York, by the way. Wild video. Uh, capture the moment the driver exploded as a tow truck driver was set to drive off with his black Chevy Silverado on 53rd Street between 1st and 2nd Avenues. There's the funniest, can't say what it says because we're not not safe for work time. But I tell you what, I'm going to post this story in the description of this program so that you can actually read what the little meme says. Let's just say it says F me. Um. Dude, put my effing truck down. I'm warning you. The suspect identified as Leosa yells at the driver. You can watch the video as well. It's quite hilarious. I'm warning you, mf -er, he says. Get the F away from my truck, he continues, before jumping into the tow truck and barreling down the street with his truck attached. Oh, what did he think the outcome was going to be? I don't understand the thought process 99% of the time in these stories. <laughs> like, this is going to solve the problem. I'm just going to steal the tow truck and drive away. Where are you going to Canada? I mean, I'm solved. Where are you driving with the tow truck? Are you, you think you're going to drive home, drop the truck off, and then just leave the tow truck on the side of the road? They'll find it and everything will be fine? Yeah, like, I know how to fix this. Steal that's the how, tow truck. That's how a seven-year-old thinks. You know, crazy. all done. <laughs> no, there's repercussions. He then slams into several parked cars before his pickup truck tips over, tumbling onto the street. That in the video, which you'll be able to see when you click on the story in the description. Police said he went on a short joyride to 55th Street and 3rd Avenue. In case you can't count blocks, 53rd to 55th is uh, two to three blocks. Just saying it wasn't very far. But Leosa's father defended him Friday, saying his son thought he was a robbery victim. Yes, because most tow truck drivers just drive around randomly and pick up trucks. Right. That's how your car gets stolen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's how cars get stolen. Tow truck drivers, evil ones, drive around and just take your shit. Yes, that's what happens. He said the tow truck was unmarked. The guy made threatening comments to him, and he thought the guy was robbing his truck, he told the New York Post. This guy is a dumb criminal. That's why he was adamant about the situation. I'm not saying that justifies what he did, his father said, how he responded. But the guy caught him by surprise, and the guy actually threatened him. Yeah, he threatened him because he took his tow truck. Yeah, and you were screaming mf -er at him and freaking out. Yeah. 
He was arrested Monday and has two prior arrests, according to cops. <laughs> He's a criminal. Shocking. Leosa of East Islip or Islip or Isley brother, whatever you want to call the town, <laughs> uh, pleaded not guilty to the charges at his Brooklyn criminal court arraignment. Because he's stupid. Uh, Judge Jennifer Tabridi set $10,000 cash bail, which he probably won't make because he thinks he needs to pay it out in pennies. I'm sure. Meanwhile, <laughs> did you like that one? You did. I did. <laughs> Meanwhile, we go to Michigan where a Macomb County man strapped propane tanks to his car in a, in a bomb hoax to prevent repossession of his car. Wow. We're getting creative here, Jess. We're getting a little bananas, Tim. Yeah, with the whole car thing. It, it's funny. We're going to Harrison Township, Michigan, where... Police arrested a man Tuesday who's believed to have created a bomb hoax in order to prevent his car from being repossessed. I, you know, okay, I got to I gotta stop real quick, tell you a quick story. I had an old roommate who was in, he wasn't in danger of having his car possessed. His car was going to be possessed. So what he did was he, he managed to keep it from being possessed for six months. And what he would do was every night he would park his car at different people's garages every night. Oh, yeah, clever. He would call somebody for a ride from that garage <laughs> home. It was the stupidest thing. Keep moving it. And it, it took so much energy. And I'm like, aren't you tired? And yeah, he's like, just let it go. He's like, no, I get to keep my car. I'm like, but you have to park it at work. They know where you work. No, you don't understand. I park it like a mile away. And then I walk to work. <laughs> he kept doing this. Oh my gosh. Day after day after day, he kept playing hide the car at all these different places until finally he, he slipped up. Like he got tired and he just, he couldn't, you know, he had, a, he had a lot of problems with, with um, his legs, you know, and he, he was diabetic and he just, he couldn't walk the mile to work. And so he parked it like a block away and some, some tracer found it and they totally totaled, got him. They towed his car. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just like, see, that's what you get. He's been playing a game of cat and mouse. But for six months, he managed yeah. to hide his car. It was just <laughs> too, too funny. Anyways, we'll get back to the story here. Harrison Township. Police arrested a man Tuesday who is believed to have created a bomb hoax in order to prevent his car from being repossessed. The Macomb County Sheriff's Office was called to a home in the 24,000 block of Bradford Drive around 9.05 a.m. for reports of a suspicious situation. Once on scene, police found a propane tank. It was seated in the passenger seat of the vehicle with electrical wire running from the tank to the inside of the middle console. Another tank was found strapped to the front driver's side wheel of the car with copper wire running underneath the vehicle. Multiple signs were also posted on the vehicle that indicated the car would blow up if it was touched. This is very Hollywood. Wow, he went all out. Yeah, he did, yeah. Police closed down the area and the Michigan State Police Bomb Squad was called in to address the situation. The squad eventually determined the whole thing was a hoax. And the tanks were not connected to anything that would cause an explosion. Police then arrested the 45-year-old suspect and will seek a formal charge of device representing or presented as explosive from the county prosecutor's office. The identity of the suspect has not been released pending formal charges being brought against him. Yeah, so bomb hooks. How, how easy is it to take two tanks, put one in the back seat, one in the, in the side seat, throw a couple of wires under something and go bomb and uh, you know, and keep your car for a little while, especially with someone who's trying to repossess it. They don't know. Any better. Yeah. Terrible idea though. Terrible idea. That's for sure. Our next story has to do with an airplane instead of a truck or a car for, for a change. Now we've had plenty of stories over the last couple of weeks, Jess, having to do with airplanes going down or airplanes having unruly passengers um, and those airplanes going down because of that. Now, with this story, 
uh, this man is just out of control. And we, we see this quite a bit. Um, we're going to the San Francisco area. And, you know, there's actually a story that came out this week, too, Jess, having to do with the fact that incidents of unruly passengers have gone down lately. Which, well, that's good. They went up for a while there, like during COVID and right after COVID. Yeah. And I don't believe this for a minute because I see at least three of these stories a week of <laughs> people getting unruly on flights that are so bad that they have to stop flights and arrest people. This is no yeah. exception. Um, the quote here is, this airplane is going down. Bay Area man arrested after a San Francisco bound flight. A Bay Area man faces 20 years in prison if convicted of interference with flight crew members following a flight to San Francisco International Airport on Monday, during which he allegedly tampered with the aircraft's overhead oxygen mask compartment and then assaulted the flight's crew. Why? I don't know. The 30-year-old man, that's part of it, he's young, is from Fremont and was on a Frontier Airlines flight from John Wayne Airport in Orange County to San Francisco. Well, that's part of it. He's entitled. <laughs> on September 9th. <laughs> According to an affidavit filed with the Justice Department, flight attendants noticed suspicious behavior from a passenger shortly after takeoff while the plane was ascending over the Pacific Ocean, still below 10,000 feet. Flight crews uh, noticed that oxygen masks in a row of the aircraft had come out of the overhead compartment. Upon investigation, they saw a man tampering with the container. Uh, the passenger appeared claustrophobic, and officials said he began yelling obscenities at flight attendants allegedly claiming we're all going to hell and this plane is going down. <laughs> okay, Yosemite Sam. <laughs> Flight crew attempted to restrain the passenger, but were unsuccessful. According to the affidavit, the passenger allegedly then attempted to choke a flight attendant before he was ultimately restrained by a seatbelt with help from other passengers. Oh my gosh, he's choking them out. What a psycho. I'm wondering if there was alcohol served on the flight. I mean, he had a few maybe. stimulants before he got on. I don't know. Officials said the man then kicked a flight attendant several times in the leg, which caused bruising and swelling that required medical attention. Or according to Flight Aware, Frontier 3581 was then diverted to Ontario International, uh, where it landed around 6 p.m. The flight was rescheduled and landed at San Francisco the following day in the early morning. If I'm on that flight, I'm pissed. The following morning? I yeah, mean, I'd be so mad. Orange County to San Francisco is not a long flight. That's ridiculous. What a jerk. Yeah. The man was arrested Wednesday on a federal criminal complaint alleging he assaulted flight attendants and if convicted, faces a statutory minimum sentence of 20 years in federal prison. You would think just the, the sentence alone would be enough to deter people, but evidently not. I don't think there's a lot of rational thought going on with some of these situations. It no. just like they just something flips in their brain and like any rationale is gone. It's gone. Yeah. Yeah, that's for sure. A couple of drug stories for you. And they're they're interesting ones at that. I, I believe this one came from Tom as well. Nearly 10 kilos of crystal meth were found in a toy box near Flint Township in a traffic stop. We're going back to Michigan where, like I said, nearly 10 kilos of crystal meth were seized during a traffic stop in Flint Township on Thursday night. The Flint Township Police Department conducted a traffic stop on a vehicle. And during the search of the vehicle, officers discovered 9.6 kilos of crystal meth or 21 pounds concealed inside a children's toy box. That's a lot of meth. The suspect, who has a criminal history of drugs and weapons offenses, was lodged, or uh, yeah, was lodged at the Genesee County Jail, pending a case review. Here is the picture, Jess, of what this looks like. Here's the child's toy box. Here's the drugs. Oh, <laughs> look at that! That's just sad, isn't it? Though, I mean, that's a lot of drugs to go in. In a kid's toy box, but geez. Hit them with the dolls. They'll never that, look there. That's right. They'll never look there. This one, believe it or not, doesn't fall under our not safe for work. But I'll tell you, it's a little, uh, it's a little borderline. A little borderline. <laughs> a woman is busted smuggling 
6,000 pounds worth of cannabis in her bra into prison. Dang. Yeah. And believe it or not, not the first time she's done it. I don't think I could get away with that. <laughs> well, <it's>, Notice. <laughs> she must be an A cup going to a D because that's a lot of, you know what, you know? I'm just, that's a I, lot. Yeah. Uh, Leah Burke was on bail for a similar alleged offense when she got caught smuggling a significant amount of cannabis into Loudoun Grange Prison in Nottinghamshire. This is over in the UK. A woman has been busted for trying to slip weed into prison using her bra. Leah Burke was caught in the act at Nottinghamshire lockup in Loudoun Grange and was ordered to Nottingham Crown Court where the true value of her underwear stash was revealed. Uh, the court heard Burke attempted to smuggle cannabis with a street value of 250 pounds, but behind bars, the price shot up to a whopping 6,600 pounds to inmates. The 30-year-old woman tried to bolt, saying she wanted to go home, only to be nabbed with the green goods. It turns out she was already on thin ice, having been bailed after a similar offense down in the Thames Valley area. Uh, slapping her with a 15-month stretch, Judge Nermal Shant KC said the amount found was not for personal use, but was intended for a person who was threatening you and for extensive supply within the prison system. Although it was a relatively small amount, it had much higher value in prison into the thousands. The judge added, you have had the best part of seven months to reflect on that, on remand in prison, and this sentence means you will not be released immediately, but in the near future, because you have served the equivalent of 14 and a half months already. Prosecutor Lucky Tandel, or is it, no, Lucky Tandy. That's a hell of a prosecutor's name, Lucky Tandy. I like it. It sounds like a stripper. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? Uh, revealed a prison search uncovered drugs stashed in Burke's bra. Miss Tandy, it, it, and it's a, it's a woman named Lucky Tandy, uh, <laughs> explained once she was arrested, her car in the car park was also searched and was found to contain a similar size package inside the driver's door. So that wasn't her first stop. She's probably, wow. you know, making the prison rounds like, <laughs> like, like a door dash for weed. Yeah. Uh, further drama unfolded as cops raided her Liverpool pad, turning up ketamine and cocaine plus digital scales. The prison hall was an estimated whopping 6,600 pounds. As we said, Rigor Purcell on the defense bench claimed Burke had been strong-armed into the offense with nasty threats hanging over her. He told the court the cannabis is worth 250 pounds on the streets, but it goes up so much because of its value in the prison system, and she accepts that. She pleaded guilty at the earliest opportunity, which perhaps demonstrates her remorse. And just this week, she has watched 15 prisoners leave on the government's early release scheme. Uh, had this matter been dealt with earlier, that might have been one of those herself. So then why take the chance? You've got seven months left, supposedly, according to this. Yeah. Why take the chance of, of running drugs into prison? I mean, unless she's being threatened with her life, but even so. I mean, that is a possibility. Maybe she's just a cog in a wheel of something worse. True. True. I don't know. Interesting. Okay, so we got a couple of stories before we get to not safe to work or not safe for work today. Uh, this story is interesting. A court uh, is is telling parents they can't name their child a certain name because this child may be bullied over it. Oh, must be really bad. Yeah, well, it's not. I, I'll tell <laughs> you. We'll we'll try to shorten it up. It's in Brazil. A Brazilian couple was told by a court that they couldn't name their newborn after an ancient king over fears the child could face bullying. You're going to laugh when I tell you why. Danilo Primola and his wife, Caterina Primola, from uh, Belo Horizonte, uh, planned to name their son Haye after the first black Egyptian pharaoh. Okay? But authorities thought the child would be subjected to bullying in the future as the name's pronunciation is similar to that of a Portuguese word for a ballet dance step. Do you know what the dance step is? No. What is it? A plie. So paille and plie. They're not even close. No, I wouldn't think those would get confused. And also, who cares? Right. 
it, I, it's it's strange. So authorities thought the child would be subjected to bullying in the future. As the name they think is similar, I don't think it is, but they say on paper, plie looks like paie, but the, the traditional spelling of paie is P-I-I-E. The way they spell it is P-I-Y-E. Still not even close, right? No. The Minas Jure Court of Justice initially blocked the parents from registering the name before a judge on Friday walked back that decision. Uh, the couple welcomed their first child on August 31st, but had already chosen the name in honor of the Kushite king and founder of the 25th dynasty of Egypt. They decided on the name after listening to the theme song for 2023 Carnival uh, celebrations while working on choreography at the Academos uh, de Venda Nova Samba School. There was a word there that talked about the black pharaoh, Danilo Primola said. Uh, we went to research what it was like, and we found the story of Paye, uh, who was a Nubian warrior who fought and conquered Egypt and became the first black pharaoh. They chose to name their son in honor of Paye because of the importance of maintaining a link to their African ancestry. Recovering African names, they say, is a powerful way to give a new narrative to the history of black people. Danilo Primola said, we have a right to educate our children with this strength, this culture, and in a way that they have representation in their name. Now, the Minas Jure Court of Justice initially sided with the Belo Horizonte's registry's office, prohibiting the naming because it could not register first names that could expose their bearers to ridicule. That was the initial finding. In their ruling, court said that pronunciation of the pharaoh's name is similar to that of the Portuguese word plie, which is a ballet dance step. That is why the sound and spelling of the name were preponderant for the rejection, the court of justice said, since they would be capable of causing future embarrassment to the child. We know that bullying cannot be combated by prohibiting it, uh, nor can it be combated by oppression, Pramola said. Bullying can be combated by studying and working on the ignorance of society as a whole, which I agree with. Uh, the legal battle delayed the baby from receiving his required vaccines. He was also late for a screening that is performed when a newborn is about five days old to detect rare but serious conditions. Camilla Primola was originally scheduled to go into labor on September 19th. She lost a pregnancy uh, she lost a pregnancy loss in 2020, it says here. I don't know what that means. And found out earlier this year she was expecting the couple's first child, according to Danilo Primola. Uh, it was euphoric. It was already planned, and it was something we wanted, he said. In the meantime, we learned about the story of the pharaoh, who was a great black weed. So there you go. They they ended up getting them what they wanted, and Paye is now, uh, now here. Good, as it should be. Yeah. So... They ended up overturning the decision. They figured out Paye is not plie, which is kind of stupid, honestly. What a ridiculous waste of the court's time. Yeah, yeah, it really So was. silly. Yeah. Okay, now, we had a story, uh, I believe it was last year, about a North Carolina pastor who was accused of assaulting a McDonald's cook and shoving the victim's head toward the deep fryer. I don't know if you remember this story or not <laughs> uh the pastor ended up pleading this past week on that case uh 57 year old Dwayne Waden not Dwayne Wade the basketball player but Dwayne Waden was busted in December following a violent confrontation at the High Point restaurant where his wife was employed now Waden arrived at the McDonald's after his spouse a manager in training called him to report that the employees were disrespecting her why you call your husband as a manager in training to put the employees in line is beyond me, but that's what she did. 45-year-old Latoya Gladney told cops she wanted Waden to assist her with the workplace issue. Waden, cops said, walked into the McDonald's kitchen and began walloping cook Theodore Garlington at the face. So he's just, you listen to my wife. <laughs> Dang. Right? Now, don't you wish your husband would come in and wallop your co-workers just to get them in line i <laughs> no? do not tim oh. i do not wish that okay because I, I don't want to see your husband walloping me in the face i mean that that would not be fun i can't even um, imagine it 
<laughs> he also allegedly wrapped his hands around Garlington's neck and began pushing his head toward the deep fryer. Yikes. I don't think I'd be working at McDonald's the next day. I think that's pretty much what I'm giving my notice. Yeah, all done. I'm going to yeah. get a nice desk job somewhere. Not worth minimum wage. Other workers interceded before the victim was rendered golden brown. Garlington suffered a large contusion on the forehead and right eye, along with scratches on his neck. By the way, I have a picture of Pastor Waden right there, the punching pastor. Wow. There he is right there. Oh, he looks strong. He's strong and pimped out in purple, if you know what I mean. <laughs> there he is right there. Um, <laughs> during a recent court hearing, Waden copped to a misdemeanor. So he, he did say, I did it, a misdemeanor assault charge, and was sentenced to serve a few weeks in the county jail, while a court order indicates that Wayne's prior number of convictions to be five. Those priors are not further detailed. Wayne's Facebook page identifies him as pastor of the Elevated Life International Ministries, which is operated from a storefront space in Thomasville that is principally occupied by the Turnaround Christian Center. The online profile lists Waden as a semi-truck driver, and former School of Divinity student at Shaw University in Raleigh. So he delivers goods for the Lord, and then he punches out your employees if they <laughs> have it coming. So there you go. Speaking of having it coming, it's time now for our Not Safe for Work part of the program. If you have kids sitting around, you probably want to lock them in a closet somewhere so they don't hear this. <laughs> I'm just saying, I don't know if you're the best parent in the world. If you're at work, you probably want to put the employees in the closet you don't want them to hear this either. And you probably want to put earmuffs on your boss. We're going to start this here in five, four, three, two, one. Here we go, Jess. We're going to talk lawsuits today in the not safe for work category. There's a couple of them. Um, the first one we dedicate to old dirty bastard because he said, yeah, baby, I like it raw. And that's what this first one's about. Trojan condoms contain cancer-causing chemicals. This is according to a lawsuit. That's uh -oh. right. That's right, fellas. It's time to take off those condoms. <laughs> because there's a lawsuit. No, no. <laughs> you now have an excuse. Condoms cause cancer. Although, ladies, I have an out for this. So if you're ready, we we each can take a side here. Okay. America's number one condom is under fire over claims that they cause toxic forever chemicals and are unfit for their intended purpose. The claims have been put forward by plaintiff Matthew Goodman in a proposed class action lawsuit filed in Manhattan on Monday against manufacturing company Church and Dwight. Goodman said that independent lab testing of the Trojan ultra thin condoms revealed the presence of organic fluorine, which is a possible indicator of forever chemicals. PFAs, which stand for per and polyfluorinated alkyl substances, are a class of chemicals that can be found in a range of everyday products from toilet paper to food packaging, cosmetics, and dental floss. Nicknamed forever chemicals, these compounds break down very slowly over time and stick around in their surrounding environment. The widespread nature of these chemicals is concerning as numerous studies have found associations between PFA exposure and increased blood cholesterol and blood pressure, reduced immunity, reproductive issues, and an increased risk of certain cancers that according to the U S agency for toxic substances and disease registry. Now, however, these chemicals, are you ready? Ladies, here's your excuse to make your man put the cat back on the thing. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> That's my best Bill Cosby. The chemicals have been found to pass through human skin. Exactly how much of a risk they pose is not entirely clear. So, buddies, put it back on. Yeah. It goes right back through the human skin. Even so, it is these fears that form the basis of Goodman's case. He says, but does it really pass through the skin? Do we really know? Oh, I could still get cancer from it. Free Willy. <laughs> Free Willy. <laughs> According to the lawsuit, Goodwin bought a pack of these condoms before becoming aware of their potential PFAS content. Based on the label, 
he, Goodman, reasonably believed the product was safe for use on his genitalia. It probably still is, buddy. You probably aren't getting laid in. Just saying. <laughs> probably still in your wallet from 10 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Had They're expired. Yeah, it's expired. Yeah. Had defendant disclosed on the label that the products contain PFAS chemicals and the harms that result from contact with PFAS chemicals, he would not have purchased the product. <laughs> he probably didn't in the first place, right? Or at the very least, he would have only been willing to pay significantly less. So he would have bartered at the counter. He would have said- He would have, paid, he would have got him still, but he would have paid less. Right, right. <laughs> I won't pay you the 20 bucks for the whole box. I'll give you, I'll give you five bucks. Oh, what a guy. Yeah. The complaint, by the way, Jess, seeks at least $5 million in damages from Church and White for purchasers of Trojan condoms across the country. So you can get your dollar two ninety five back. <laughs> everybody gets a buck. Yep, everybody gets a buck. <laughs> Which, <laughs> opposed to what they got while they were wearing them, <laughs> rhymes with buck. Oh, you know what I'm saying? See what you did um, there. See what I did there? Mm -hmm. uh, but who is the independent lab that found the organic fluoride in the condoms in the first place? Well, on February 6th, earlier this year, advocacy blog Momovation conducted a study into the presence of PFAS and common condom and lubricant brands across the U.S. The group sent 29 different condoms and lubricants on the market today to an EPA-certified laboratory to test for that stuff. And specifically, they were testing for the presence of organic fluoride. They're the ones who found it. So even though Momovation called for the removal of the PFAS from those products, should we be concerned about the results? Momovation says no, Jess. We shouldn't be concerned really? at all. In fact, they say when you add up the total PFAS, not a thing to be worried about. So there you go. Yeah. Another frivolous lawsuit. I just thought it was interesting. Thought it was interesting. This guy, much ado about nothing. It was kind of fun. All right. Under our next not safe for work uh, story. Why is it? Okay. So I'm going to ask you something here, Jess. In all the stories we've covered about people who get nude and commit crimes. Yeah. Why is it like when we get nude women who, who do things in public, um, it doesn't seem like they, they do much when they get arrested. Nude men seem to get naked and be very uh, productive, but you can't get them to do anything when they're clothed. Why is that? Is it, that they're, is it like they're looking to get busy and they think if I get naked, some woman will see me and they'll be like, that guy, he's got a lot going on. Look at all the stuff he's accomplishing when he's naked. Yeah, look look at how he's hanging. Yeah, look at how he's hanging. <laughs> I think I'll take advantage of that. Look at him getting all that stuff done when he's naked. <laughs> I've never figured that out. I, I don't. I don't it. understand it myself, Tim. I don't think we're ever going to be able to answer this question. Well, this story got me perplexed. So, allow me to uh, take us to Alabama. Okay. The home of naked men who get a lot of stuff done. I don't know what this is. Uh, a nude man is arrested after allegedly attempting to take an Alabama police officer's patrol car. Oh. <laughs> He's industrious. <laughs> uh, Madison police are attempting to discover the identity of a nude man who law enforcement officers say attempted to steal a patrol car Thursday afternoon after a string of incidents along a busy highway. The incident happened about... 1.35 p.m. when police from Madison and Huntsville responded to multiple 911 calls in an area on Alabama 72 West in Promenade Park or Point Parkway. Uh, calls from Madison Bowling Center, Burger King, Walmart, and Mr. Car Wash reported that a nude man tried to enter people's vehicles, breaking windows and assaulting people. So, you know, he was trying to make friends. I, I don't know what that's all about. So weird. Yeah, uh -huh. you know, when you're when you're naked, you got to meet people, I guess. Uh, callers also reported the man was possibly dragged by a vehicle after trying to enter it while it was occupied. Oh, a little road rash. I would drive very quickly too if someone uh, came to my door naked and trying to get yeah. in. Yeah, 
Well, depending on how they looked. I mean, <laughs> I mean yeah, I'm a discriminating type. I'm not going to lie. I'll just put that out there. Uh, Madison police arrived on the scene and made contact with the man on Promenade Point Parkway. According to police, the unidentified man attempted to enter and steal an officer's patrol car, and the officer used force to detain the man, as would be expected. He's naked after all. I, I taste the shit out of him too. I'm just yeah. Saying. Hey, it's cuff and stuff. Throw him in the back. Yep. Uh, Huntsville police are investigating the alleged crimes that occurred prior to the officers arriving. Madison police arrested the man for the attempted theft of the police vehicle and other alleged public order crimes. He was transported to Huntsville Hospital for medical treatment and will be jailed upon his release. Police said the man's identity is still being verified, probably because he didn't have any ID on him. Where are you going to put it? <laughs> exactly. You got one spot, Jess, and I'll tell you this much. If I'm a cop, I'm not reaching for it. Nope. Nope. Leaving it, it alone. It can sit there as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> I'm not getting it. <laughs> Neither is my partner. Just saying that. All right. Our next story. We're going to Michigan, and I've got a conundrum for you. You're at your house, and a crime is occurring in your neighbor's yard. Now, I'm going to be very specific about the crime here, James. It involves your uh, your neighbors, of course, but or does it? All you see is two people in a car, or two people on the driveway next to a car, there's a little uh, 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 going on. Um, do you report the people? <laughs> and if so, um, do you allow, uh, well, we'll put it this way. Do you call it in one? And two, if it's put on the news, <laughs> do you um, do you call in and say, if, if there's video of it, let's say your ring doorbell camera captures it. Oh, no. <laughs> Do you say, I know those people? And do you call in and say, I know those people? And do you report that you know those people and get them arrested? Yeah, our cameras would definitely catch it. And um, I don't know. I guess if it was my neighbors themselves doing it, mm -hmm. I'd probably be less inclined to call it in and have a personal conversation with them. But if it was some random people in my neighbor's driveway doing that, I would definitely call that in. Okay. Because I, I don't know how one is worse than the other, but I don't know. But this story is bizarre because these these this uh, this particular story, this particular whole scenario is just bizarre. As a couple attempted to have sex in a Farmington Hills driveway, first of all, why a driveway? But was it their driveway? No. Oh, yeah. See, that's more disturbing to me that random people would be in my neighborhood just getting it on in our driveways. That's, yeah. Yeah. But they, you know, yeah. when they urge hits. Huh. So this couple are having sex in a Farmington Hills driveway. And I don't know what's more creepy, Jess, the fact that they found a place in a driveway to have sex. It wasn't their own driveway they had sex in. Yeah. Just didn't find a better place to have sex. I don't know. It, it, the whole thing's creepy, right? I feel like anywhere would be better, like practically anywhere. I mean, especially now with everybody, like we have cameras in front of our house and the doors and also like above our garage. And you just can't do that in residential areas anymore and get away with it. Just go find a better public park or something. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm, you know advocating for that but <laughs> a remote mountain somewhere everybody has cameras Almost right anywhere anywhere would be better but here's the thing okay so they obviously caught it on camera here's the picture right oh my goodness I mean, why got them on camera i mean if you're watching a video if you're listening to this on audio if you see the video version of this at darknessradioshow.com They've got them on camera. Yeah. And things are blurred out. There's definitely. Yeah. I mean, they stuff going on. No shame in their game. So police in Farmington Hills are asking for the public's help in identifying. And this is the thing. They put this on the news. Oh, my gosh. 
Police in Farmington Hills are asking for the public's help in identifying two people who were captured on camera attempting to have sex in a stranger's driveway. The incident happened Monday, September 9th. According to authorities, a silver Toyota Corolla backed into a home's driveway. So they exposed their license plate. What the heck? Mm -hmm. No thought. <laughs> like literally no, no thought of consequences from this. No. no. The couple then exited the vehicle, pulled their pants down, and prepared to have sex when they were interrupted by a passing vehicle. So they didn't even take to the back seat. They're just like, what? let's get down on this nice, comfortable tar and do it, baby. <laughs> How? The incident, including the couple's exposed genitals, was captured on the home's doorbell camera. Police said a young boy was expecting a delivery and opened the security cameras live stream while at school after getting notified of motion detected in the driveway. No. Yes. <laughs> no. That's not my Poor kid. <laughs> Just went from bad to worse. Wait a minute. Mommy and daddy are making sandwiches again. But hold on. It's in the middle of the day. Like, it's not even evening. It's not even under the cover of darkness. It's just, like, boldly in the middle of the afternoon. Yeah. Yeah. Like, hey, this tar looks uh, looks good. Why don't we pull over here? Anyone who recognizes the two, <laughs> what, from their flashing asses, you're going to recognize nice. them, them? <laughs> or has any information, is asked to contact the Farmington Hills Police Department. <laughs> <laughs> so bad that is one of the worst stories isn't that something you think that's bad i got worse oh. oh no yes i got worse okay bring it a voyeur and predator of the worst kind a missouri mom sues a cop for allegedly stealing her nude selfies meant for her husband during a traffic stop what oh yeah we're getting worse, Jess. Ugh. Here we go. A 24-year-old Missouri woman filed a $25,000 lawsuit on Friday, calling a local cop a sexual voyeur and predator of the worst kind over what she said was a traffic stop that turned into an invasion of privacy. The plaintiffs in the lawsuit are identified as Jane and John Doe, a married couple living in Florissant, who have several children. They sued the Florissant police department and an officer identified only as Joe Smith whose true identity they do not know and who the department says is no longer employed as a police officer. According to the complaint, Smith runs amok in the city. This is a quote, victimizing people like Jane Doe filing details, a series of events that occurred in February of 2024 when Smith pulled Jane Doe over for a traffic stop due to a broken taillight. The officer allegedly asked Doe if she had insurance and curiously, Officer Smith told plaintiff that she needed to pull up proof of insurance on her phone and show it to him. Doe said that when she unlocked her phone to show her insurance, the officer abruptly took her phone back to his police vehicle without her consent, disconnected the Bluetooth connection with the woman's car, and remained in his car with the phone for about 10 minutes. Wow. Yeah. Ultimately, the lawsuit says Smith returned the phone and drove away without issuing a ticket. I wonder why. I don't want any evidence of his crime. Yeah. The following July, Doe was contacted by the FBI in what she said was not a pleasant experience. Agents asked Doe to identify a photograph of a naked woman that had been printed and enlarged. Yikes. Oh, no. According to the lawsuit, Doe was shocked to find that the photograph was of herself. And it was a photograph that she had only ever exchanged with her husband. According to the filing, the FBI alerted Doe that the picture of her was not the only explicit photo they discovered in Smith's possession. Doe asserted in the complaint that Smith scrolled through her phone, uh, voyeuristically viewing naked photos of both her and her husband and their intimate messages, then used his own phone to take pictures of Doe's pictures. Doe said that since the incident, she has been 
incredibly disturbed and suffered humiliation, severe emotional distress, and a, a shattering of her trust. Plaintiffs have lost all faith in the fluorescent police and grow nervous whenever they see an officer, the filing said. Doe said that she has several severe or suffered, I'm sorry, she said that she has suffered severe anxiety as a result of the incident and has incurred related medical expenses. Doe brought claims for invasion of privacy, intentional infliction of emotional distress, negligent infliction of emotional distress, trespass to chattels, negligent hiring, negligent retention, negligent supervision, and negligent training and requested $25,000 in damages. That's it. $25,000 in damages. Yeah. That's it. She could get more than that, I would think. I would think she could go for a mill. Yeah. At least, but no. The Florissant Police Department noted that the following statement on Facebook on Wednesday, they claim that they're aware of the lawsuit alleging officer misconduct while on duty. They say they're deeply concerned by the allegations and want to assure the community that they take any claim of officer misconduct very seriously. The safety of everyone in their community remains their top priority. They hold their employees to a high standard of integrity and expect them to treat every member of the community with dignity and respect. The FBI, St. Louis Division, is leading the investigation into the matter and the department is cooperating with the investigation. The officer in question is no longer employed by the city of Florissant and there is no indication that any member of the Florissant Police Department is involved in the alleged misconduct. The plaintiffs believe there might be other victims, according to CBS affiliate KMOV. Prosecutors also reportedly investigated, or are investigating rather, to determine whether to bring criminal charges. You think that's bad? If you think that's depraved, I got another level. Oh no. We just keep getting worse and worse, Tim. There's only a couple stories left, Jess, and then we're done. <laughs> I swear to you. I swear to you. I'm put on my seatbelt. Buckle up. Your gardens are not safe if you live in Northwest D.C. We go to Washington D.C., Jess, where a man is wanted for a sex act with a cucumber. What? <laughs> no. I'm going to have to purge my mind after this episode. <laughs> I told you this is going to be the, one of the most depraved episodes. Well, I didn't tell you that, but now I'm going to have to go watch the Hallmark Channel or something. That's right. You're going to have to watch a Christmas movie on the Hallmark Channel after this and clear your brain. You have to scrub your brain. All right. Let's Look. have it. Lay it on us. We go to Washington, D.C., where police said they were investigating after a homeowner's camera caught a man performing a sex act on himself with a cucumber in her driveway. What is it with driveways in this episode? Oh, no place is safe. Stay out of people's driveways. If you're going to do something depraved, go in their backyard. Yeah, keep your weird kinks in your own driveway. <laughs> the Metropolitan Police Department said it happened around 5.30 p.m. at dinner time to a cucumber. <laughs> that could have been somebody's pickle. <laughs> Happened around 5.30 p.m. on Friday, September 6th in the Truxton Circle neighborhood, not far from Dunbar High School. DC News now obtained video of the incident from the owner. I don't want to see it, but there's pictures. <clears throat> uh, from the owner of the security camera who hoped sharing the footage, which she posted on Reddit, yes, it's out there on Reddit, would help police identify the man in order to protect her neighbors and students. Catherine Baker said, after reviewing the footage, I was so disgusted and freaked out. By the way, this is what, did this man smell it or eat it afterwards? Look at, this is what it looks like, Jess. What is he doing? And I don't want to know exactly. Is he smelling it or eating it afterwards? I don't know. Is he taking it home in a basket? <laughs> Darknessradioshow.com if you're listening to the audio and need to see this on video. What I is don't he understand. With that? I don't know. I hope he's not using it for sexual pleasure and then taking it home to eat it. <laughs> did he go back door and front door on that deal or what did he do? I don't know. I, what does a man do with a cucumber sexually? I can't he understand puts it, this. Yes. When a man loves a cucumber, he puts it in his anus. 
Um, <laughs> but other than that, <laughs> I mean, that's about the only thing you can do with it. And then he, it, like, he's literally carrying it away in like lunchbox uh, or something. You, you could give it oral. I'm just saying, but, uh, it, it was, Oh man. Sorry. I had to give you that, that graphic description, but, uh, it was around dinner time when Baker's camera recorded a man with an apparent lunchbox entering her driveway and he brought it, he brought it from home. What? What? Why? I thought he must have stolen it from her garden or something, but he brought his own cucumber to her house. He's industrious. Wow. <laughs> He's got some serious issues. This is the next level. It was around dinner time when Baker's camera recorded a man with an apparent lunchbox entering her driveway and lodging a cucumber in the grill of Baker's SUV. The video shows a man checking to see if the coast is clear before turning his back to the SUV and beginning to use the cum uh, cucumber <laughs> in the sex act. I almost said something else. I want... I want people, I want my neighbors to know, to keep an eye out for this person. I want parents to be mindful. There's a lot of kids. There are high school students. They walk themselves to and from school, but we all have to be vigilant about this kind of thing. Oh, my God. You have to see this picture. <laughs> you have to see this picture. <laughs> oh, my gosh. He latched it in the grill of the car. Yeah, and then he, he did then that. He oh my god i'm so disturbed i just i didn't know what to say anymore well he probably needed an entry point he did it was too big to fit oh no <laughs> the police report baker filed details something else that is clear in the video the man cho chose to keep going he comes around the passenger side of the suv then performs a sexual act again he appears to notice the security camera before putting the cucumber back in the lunchbox and then walks down the adjacent alley. It was the eye contact that really unsettled me because it then continues for longer than one would imagine, Baker said. And of course, then he saves the cucumber for later. So it really leaves one with a lot of questions that no one wants to have on their mind, Baker continued, who had not seen the man prior to his appearance in the video. DC's indecent exposure law says that any public penetration for sexual gratification violates the law. Penalties include up to a fine of $300, prison time of no more than 90 days or both. Outside Dunbar High School Tuesday, Safe Passage Ambassador Venia Nahr told DC News Now, there are children walking around neighborhood kids, elementary school, middle school, and high school, so it's just a kid-friendly neighborhood, so we definitely want him out of the way. But who's looking out for the cucumbers, Jess? That's what I want to know. Poor cucumber. What did that right? cucumber ever do to anyone? Nothing. That cucumber has rights to. That's right. Has a right to be pickled. <laughs> and not assaulted, if you know what I mean. I mean, maybe later in the brining process. But Yeah, yeah. he gets picked and he's all excited. He's like, maybe I'm going to be a pickle. Maybe I'm going to get chopped up and get salt and peppered. And Maybe he gets stuck in this lunchbox and he's like, oh, God, no. <laughs> Maybe I'll be in a salad someday. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, hey, wait, what's a salad? A, what's this dark tunnel? Oh, <laughs> it's really shitty in here. Um, yeah. Oh, no. Go figure. It doesn't get better, Jess. It doesn't get better. <laughs> how it can get worse i'm afraid i'm very afraid um oh, well let me take a drink of my tea i gotta clear my palate let's let's take a drink both Cheers. you and I, already. I wish this was vodka i do too yeah all right and here we go a woman is again busted for a domestic dildo battery we go to florida not once but twice she's a repeat uh, dildo offender and a repeat of a 2022 accident or incident. It was an accident the first time. The second time, it's on purpose, if you know what I mean. This Floridian was jailed in a sex toy tiff. The second time in two years, a Florida woman has been arrested for a dildo-related domestic battery. 35-year-old Chelsea White and her boyfriend were in the kitchen about to eat 
when the man discovered that his missing glass dildo was inside White's backpack in the couple's Fort Pierce residence. This is when we need to stop and say, why is it the man's dildo in glass dildo at the hat? He was wondering, but, you know, to each their own. That's right. And why is she the one who stole his dildo and has it in her backpack? Let's continue. During the 11 p.m. tussle that ensued, White and the 35-year-old victim exchanged assorted blows, and not the nice kind. After the pair <laughs> briefly separated, the man told cops, White began hitting him again after he went to grab the backpack. White was standing in the kitchen and threw the glass dildo at her bow. The dildo missed its target, instead hitting a door and waking the couple's child. Oh, they have children. That's great. This is when you shouldn't see mommy and daddy's fight over the dildo. Just... I wonder if the dildo shattered. I mean, it's glass. Did it break into a bunch of pieces? I'm wondering that as well. It's huh. funny. Yeah. White subsequently grabbed the bag and walked away with or walked away from the property. She was located hours later and arrested for domestic battery. White, who was locked up in the county jail in lieu of a thousand dollars bond, was arraigned Wednesday on the misdemeanor on the misdemeanor count. Uh, her next court appearance is scheduled for October 4th. When questioned by deputies about the recent confrontation, the victim said that White was arrested in the past for a similar incident when they got into an altercation over a dildo. They can't share their sex toys, Jess. Why can't they just get along? Maybe Buy two glass dildos, one for him, one for her. And they should etch him and her in the dildo. They should go to yeah. a glass maker and... Yeah, put their names. Anniversary in. gift. Done. Problem solved. Right? And then they don't have to share. And then they can get along. Marital bliss. Yeah. All right. <sighs> okay, so they had not their first altercation. White was busted in late 2022 when a verbal argument over a handbag and a sex toy turned violent. White, investigators charged, kicked and bit the victim who had asked White to return the sex toy to him because he owned it. White, however, refused to give the sex toy back to the victim. Oh, kids. White subsequently was found guilty of battery and sentenced to 12 months probation. She was ordered to pay about $800 in fines and court fees and was required to complete a batterer's intervention program. When really, what, 100, 150 for a glass dildo? I don't know. I haven't priced glass dildos lately, Jess. I was wondering, like, are they just so expensive they can't afford to buy more than one? Like, maybe glass is really expensive. It could be. But it's more expensive to do $800 in court fees because you've yeah. won. It is unclear the same dildo, if it was the same dildo involved in the 2022 and 2024 episodes, really unclear if they'd washed it in between then. So <laughs> I brought that up. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. <laughs> But hey, if you're going to go, go all the way. By the way, here's the lovely queen that keeps battering her husband with um, the dildo. Yeah. Yeah. So She looks a little sad. Yeah, she does, doesn't she? She yeah. looks like she doesn't know how to stop squinting. That's <laughs> it must be a sharp glass dildo. Yeah. I don't know. Hmm. Yeah. All right. I think we're finally down to, I do have a, oh no, we're we're done to the last two. I do have a palate cleanser at the end. Oh, good. I, I need a, it. I have a mind clearer. Okay. The, okay. Um, <laughs> this story, actually, I'm going to, I've got a bit of a, I've got a bit of a side sidebar that will prepare us for the last story, <laughs> which is okay. traumatizing. Here's your, here's your palate cleanser. Uh, not, not the palate cleanser at the end, but here's your, your sidebar. Here's your sidebar. This one was sent to me by a listener. Has nothing to do with anything other than shaving a haircut. Okay. Your jiggly bits. <clears throat> Here we go. Size matters in Thailand when you're going to get a haircut. A Thai barber goes viral for his pricing list based on your penis size. I don't know what this has to do with a crime other than if you're getting shortchanged, you're getting shortchanged, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. A barber in the central province of Ayutthaya 
went viral on Thai social media for charging customers based on the size of their penis rather than the length of their hair. A picture of the service price list at the barber shop in Ayutthaya was shared by numerous Thai news agencies and netizens. The pricing list stated small penis, 40 baht, medium penis, 60 baht, large penis, 80 baht, and mo or modified penis, 100 baht. Wait. Yeah. How are they modifying it? Well, I maybe um, you know, like you had one put on. Oh, okay. Yeah, like you originally didn't have one, but now you do. Okay, okay, okay. I'm following you. Yeah, you know, you know what I mean. The barber, forty-year-old Apiric T. Klinbuppa, shared in an interview with Channel Three that he opened the barber shop just three months ago and received very positive feedback. He believed that the service fees based on penis size played an important role in attracting customers. Um, Apirak explained that he had been searching for his dream job for over eight years and had worked in various industries before finding happiness as a barber. His shop located near one of Ayit Haya's um, popular tourist attractions, Prazak Nahung Luang, was decorated in a vintage style to match with historical attractions. Apiric mentioned that he had not yet named his barbershop and had not planned any advertising for it. He did not expect the humorous service fee to make his business go viral, explaining that it reflected his personality. <laughs> Evidently, it's measuring wangs. That's his, his personality. So there you go. Does he make customers prove it? Like how? I think he does. He has to. Oh my God. Like, what does that have to do with anything? Like he's not cutting their pubic hair, is he? Like he's cutting their hair. Well, he says the service fee actually depends on the customer's age and hairstyle. Like in other barber shops. he says, I charge children such as those in primary school, the small penis fee of 40 baht. <laughs> High school students are charged the medium penis fee of 60 baht. Well, adult customers pay the large penis fee of 80 baht. Any customer wanting a more complex hairstyle is required to pay a hundred baht. So that's like saying they're kids and, oh, okay, I got it. Yeah, yeah. It's like so, a kid's meal. Yeah, like a kid's meal. So. 12 and under. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, it's sad not... if you're a grown-up who qualifies for the child price, though. That's sad. Mm -mm. That's a bummer. Wouldn't you, how would you like it if, okay, so you go in, <laughs> you're a guy, you go in and you're like, yeah, I'm going to have to pay the, I'm going to have to pay the 80 bot. You know, give me the 80 bot. And he goes, you 40. Yeah. <laughs> How would you feel if you're like, no, I'm not 40, I'm 80. Yeah, no, you 40. And then he laughs about it. No, you 40. Ah, That's kind of funny though. That's kind of funny. That's hysterical. You 40. I would hate if that. I, if I was a guy, I would go to him just because he clearly has a good sense of humor. I would too. But no, I'd, I'm, I'm getting the 40 every time. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you know what? You know what I would get with this haircut? I, I'd get nothing because I shaved my own head. I was going to say, it's probably free. You got to do that yourself, right? Just a little yeah. razor. Yep. I don't go to a barber. So. No, my husband does his own hair too. I just have to supervise and make sure he doesn't miss any strays in the back. Does he? Yeah. I just double check for him. He's like, did I get it all? You never do when you have one of those, um, when you have one of those uh, automatic razors or when you have one of those um, automatic razors, listen to me. When you have one of those head shavers. No. Oh. Yeah. Have you bought him one of those head shavers? No, you're going to have to send me a link. I will. I'll send you a link to one of those. Get him one for his birthday. You never miss. You never <laughs> miss. That's for sure. All right. We've delayed the trauma long enough. Actually, uh, for you ladies out there, I think we've got the perfect gift for Mother's Day. Oh, no. <laughs> All right. I got to admit, I saw this story elsewhere and I had to bring it up here because, uh, Jess, uh, it, it's it's about time for ladies to get their revenge. Are you ready for this? Yeah, I like a little good woman revenge. Here we go. A state senator who flipped to GOP is accused of making a staffer perform oral sex to the point where he is now in a wheelchair. What? <laughs> That's right. She crippled him? She crippled him. He's now filed a lawsuit. Oh, my. 
This now makes her a criminal. <laughs> How does one cripple someone? I okay, I'm ready for this story. You're about to find out. Oh my. Let's just put it this way. I, I'm I'm gonna make a joke here that only Minnesotans will understand. <laughs> Either this guy is dedicated to his job, or he is so out of touch with being intuitive with this woman that he's like He's like a Minnesotan trying to find a winter carnival medallion in a snowbank. He can't find a clue, if you know what I mean, right? He doesn't have a clue. Oh, man. Did you get that joke? I did, of course. <laughs> Nobody in the audience besides Minnesotans knows what that means. <laughs> They're all laughing. <laughs> Let me explain the joke to those of you who don't know. The St. Paul Pioneer Press has a winter carnival medallion hunt every year for the St. Paul Winter Carnival. You have to read the clues in the St. Paul Pioneer Press every day in order to find the Winter Carnival medallion. Most of the time it's hidden in the snowbank. You can't find the Winter Carnival medallion in the snowbank. You're stupid <laughs> because they give you obvious clues. Yes. All right. With that, a staffer injured himself so badly giving oral sex to his state senator that he ended up in a wheelchair, according to a lawsuit. Chad Condon claims that California Senator Marie Alvarado Gill had to push his wheelchair around a casino after he gave her oral sex in a cramped car seat. <laughs> I wish you guys could see. Jim. I mean, at least they weren't doing it in someone's driveway. Yes, at least it wasn't in a driveway, right? Although if they could have stretched out in a driveway, he might not have been in the wheelchair. She continued to make sexual comments as she pushed him around the casino, he claims. <laughs> Got humiliated afterwards. I fully expected this to be a male senator and a female performing oral sex on him as the other way around. So that is the first thing to blow my mind. Oh, yes, Jess. <laughs> Sit back and enjoy. Are you ready for this? Yes. Condit has uh, has since recovered the use of his legs and is suing Alvarado Gill for sexual harassment, retaliation, and violation of California labor law. Newsweek sought email comment from attorneys for Condit and Alvar Alvarado Gill and from Alvarado Gill's office on Tuesday. Condit, who is Alvarado Gill's chief of staff, claims in the lawsuit that the senator created a hostile work environment that was leaden with sexual discussion. Alvarado Gill also talked about other staff members' sex lives to plaintiff and showed him her phone showing other staff members' location. She commented that the staff member was at a hotel effing some guy, the lawsuit alleges. Condit claims that Alvarado Gill sought oral sex from him as a way of showing his subordinate position. The lawsuit alleges that the last time he had to give her oral sex was at a staff retreat. During the last occasion where plaintiff performed oral sex as demanded by Alvarado Gill, plaintiff suffered a back injury while performing in a car seat while his body was having to twist and contort in the confined space of the car, the lawsuit alleged. Plaintiff later went to the doctor and discovered that the injury was more severe and that the plaintiff had suffered three herniated discs in his back and a collapsed hip. Oh my gosh. Just my brain is melting right now from the story. <laughs> Evidently, if you have three herniated discs, discs and a collapsed hip, you're not doing it right. Yeah, but I mean, this is terrible. Like he felt like he had to do this for work. I hope they throw the book at her as they would a man if mm. this was on the other foot. The lawsuit says that after being discharged from the hospital, Condon's wife drove him to a staff retreat after party at a casino. He's married? Mm hmm wonder if the wife gets as good a treatment at home as Alvarado Gill does. Oh, my gosh. Alvarado Gill took charge and pushed plaintiff around the casino in a wheelchair. Then Alvarado Gill made a sexual remark, the suit says. I don't mean to laugh, but I mean, it's just... It's so bad. It's... <laughs> Can you imagine... You're trying to service your boss that great. You herniate three discs and you prolapse a hip. 
you have to go to the hospital. You're in a wheelchair. And she's pushing you around going, well, you didn't get me to the mountaintop there, Gimpy. What are you going to do for, what are you going to do for an encore? Oh. I mean, it's just, yikes. Right? This is bad all the way around. Alvarado Gill appeared to enjoy her power and demanded this show of loyalty on several occasions. There was no sexual intercourse. Rather, it was Alvarado Gill treating this demand as a perk of her power and that plaintiff would be a tool to service her continual demand asking if he would kiss it. Yikes. Plaintiff was demeaned and meant to feel empty and subordinate to his boss a California state senator with power over his career and livelihood, according to the lawsuit. Alvarado Gill's attorney, Ogninen, I believe it is Gavriloff, has rejected the allegations made by Condon. In a statement to the New York Post, Gavriloff called Condon a disgruntled former employee who was telling an outlandish story. I don't know if you've got medical records showing you've got three herniated discs and a screwed up hip. I think you're telling the truth. I mean, if it's not fabricated and this is real, she's a bad person. <laughs> just... He said Condit's allegations were bogus financially motivated claims. Alvarado Gill uh, is known for switching from the Democratic Party to the Republican Party in August, saying that Democrats' left-wing ideology made it unrecognizable from the party that she joined. What that has to do with the cost of whatever and whatever it has nothing to do with the fact that by God, she crippled a man with the iron vag. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's her legacy. That's her legacy right there. <laughs> That's how she's going to be known in Congress. Just saying. <laughs> All right. I got a, a palate cleanser before we end uh, dumb crime, stupid criminals today it has to do with a medical call. In Indiana. It turned into something completely different, Jess. Here's the story. Emergency responders in Indiana experienced a first when a medical call ended with firefighters rescuing a monkey that got loose and that scaled the building. Aw. Yeah. He was probably scared. He probably was. The, I believe it is loose, L-U-C-E, Fire Territory cited a Facebook post that firefighters responded alongside Spencer County EMS and the Spencer County Sheriff's Office to a call for medical assistance in Sandridge and were confronted with a first for all three departments. The post said responders uh, tending to the patient learned their monkey had gotten loose and scaled the building and could not get down on its own. Firefighters were able to safely bring the monkey down and it was cared for by deputies while EMS tended to its owner. Aww. So, was the man with the yellow hat okay? Yes, the man with the yellow hat was just fine. Thank you for asking, <laughs> Jess. <laughs> that's a good, that's a good spin on it. And that's how we end dumb crime, stupid criminals for today. <laughs> the man with the yellow hat. Oh, come on. Man with the yellow hat. All right. So <laughs> you have two books that are out now. I do have two books that are out. They're officially out in the world. You can get them on Amazon.com or Barnes and Noble, whichever you prefer. Ghosts of Ghostly Tales of Pennsylvania and Monsters of the Northeast. That's right. That's right. And you can get those in the link in the description of this program. Um, also, uh, the Palmer trips are available. They're up. Uh, you can still get your discount. You better hurry though, because I have a feeling this discount's coming off the table if you don't take advantage of it soon. Um, so go book that trip to the Palmer. Jess and I will be up there along with Ghost Stories, Inc. And uh, it's going to be a fun time. There's a theme. Yeah. Speakeasy spirits. Wear your best 1920s gear on Friday right. night for a party. That's right. Our band and everything. I'm looking up zoot suits and I got to try and find it in my size. I'm shrinking. So I got to try and find one in my size. A zoot suit. Yes. You have, to, you have to get all fancy, Tim. That's right. I'm going to. I, I got a flapper dress. I'm super excited to wear it again. It's Really? It's so pretty. There you go. There you go. So that is coming up in November. Um, also, tomorrow on the big show, Supernatural News and the return of Mally Fox. Yay! I'm excited for Mally to come back. We've missed her. Yes, we have. So Mally will be back tomorrow. 
and a special guest on Thursday to be revealed. So there you go. Lots of big stuff this week. Um, hmm, what else? That's about it. That's all I got for today. So thank you so much for joining us, Jess, uh, today. And we appreciate it. And uh, we got Supernatural News tomorrow. So that's what we got. That'll do it for today. Thank you so much for joining us today on the big program right here on True Crime Tuesday. We'll see you tomorrow for Supernatural News right here on Darkness Radio. For more audio and video archives of True Crime Tuesday, please visit darknessradioshow.com. Thank you for watching.